You're watching Co-op for 2, March 10th, 2024, around 11 p.m., and we are continuing our playthrough of Mortem Medieval Detective, the expansion called The Shelter. This is part two. This will be the finale. We will surely finish the case today. We're on the last day of the case. Yesterday, we played for about five and a half hours. If you haven't watched yesterday's playthrough, then this will make no sense at all, and there's no point in being here. So, let's go over our plan for today. I think we're going to spend a big chunk of time in this session, especially at the beginning, rereading and talking about what's going on. Because the very last card we've read is telling us that we're on our last day here. Our ailing companion seemed to be finally on his way to recovery. We decided not to spend another night in this distressing place. When we get to 6 p.m., Then we end our investigation and prepare to leave. I've just noticed that it says prepare to leave. Are we actually going to be able to leave? I'm not so sure anymore. But it does say end your investigation. However, there's a giant stack of cards we haven't been through yet. Clearly... Most of them we won't ever see, but still, there are a lot of cards left. Okay, let's check in the chat with the chat before we talk a little bit more. Matt is here. Um, Matt's playing more Arkham LCG. I see they just released a new box for it. Arkham LCG is a real, I have a real love-hate relationship with it, and it's one of the few games that I feel like might be better played on the easier mode. Okay, um, so let's talk about our plan for this possibly final day, certainly wrapping up the case. A a big event happened at the end of our previous day that we need to go back, reread, and think about because it was complicated. It looked like a scene of another murder, a double murder, but both people turned out to be alive. So we're going to reread that, but I think we may have to reread most of the stuff. Um, so a little bit of recap and rereading, then I think we should talk about our main theories for the case. And then we have to plan out our last day, because we have to be very efficient about it. There's lots of things left to do. And we're going to have to think hard about how we want to spend our time. So I'm thinking maybe the best way to start do our recap is to start at the end events, reread the end events of yesterday. And try to understand better what's just happened. So if you remember, we ended the last night by gathering everyone together. So I believe that ending, yes, here's the card. So we took this advice. We chose to end the day in this way. Maybe it would be a good idea to gather all the residents in one place, spend the nights where we could see each other. That way the killer wouldn't be able to do anything without being noticed. So that's how we chose to end our day, which gave us card 52. At dinner, we proposed everyone spend the night in the same room. People didn't love it, but they agreed. Emptied the dining hall, brought down several beds, and decided to keep watch. So Rostique and Garana take first watch, Tekin swaps out with one, and so on. 
But first we had to have a funeral. We buried Vaclov's body. That means we've buried both bodies now. This time it was Namira who cried. She cursed the unknown killer, prayed to the heavens that the crime would not go unpunished. Tekin struggled to pull her away from the body so we could lower her into the grave. Okay, and we didn't have the keyword lock. That's unfortunate. And then it said reveal card 83, but then it also says to flip this. Okay, so this is just a picture of this scene where we've laid out the beds in the dining room. Is there anything else to notice about this picture? We haven't found anything important in any pictures, and I don't want us to miss anything. The only thing I noticed is that there's laundry strung up here. Other than that, not really. Okay, let's put that away. Okay, so then we're told to get card 83 because we don't have the lock keyword. Okay, so the first watch goes on duty, and the rest of us try to go to sleep. But there's a problem. Yuika refuses to sleep. He's the mentally challenged kid, 20-year-old. He doesn't understand, or at least he claims not, and he insists on going up to his room, which we let him. Everything's quiet so they can hear everything. They hear rats. They hear the window shutters. Don't sleep well. Children keep waking up with random requests. Mirad cried and whined until Garana went to bed and allowed him to hide under her blanket. That makes me think that he sleeps in his little crate at night. We suspected the little kid. Well, we suspected everyone all along. Okay, and then it's end of day information, which we did, and then keep reading. And here's where things start to go wrong. The night's nearly over. So it's late at night. During a shift change, Namira insists that she has to go to the office. For some unknown reason. Why could that possibly be? Why, why would she possibly suddenly at like 4 a.m. need to go to the office? So that's our first mysterious thing that's happened. Why on earth does Namira need to go to her office? That's very suspicious. I'm not sure we picked up on this before, but that's kind of crazy. For a minute to do something important, that's completely suspicious. But Tekin and Cress, Cress is one of ours, nod silently but she doesn't return. 10 minutes later, Tekin go, is about to go check on her when Yuika, the mentally handicapped kid, screams. We hear something heavy falling on the floor. It seems to be coming for her from her office. Cress and Tekin rush there, then the rest of us. So, at this point, the only people who are out of this room when this happens are Namira and Yuika, right? So those are the only people that are out of this room. They're the only candidate suspects, if it's a human suspect that's doing something wrong. We go into the office, and she's sitting at her desk, her head resting on her hands. Okay. Her head just resting on her hands. Yuika is lying in front of the desk in a pool of blood. Next to him was a rusty cutter. Does that mean a knife? 
For a moment, everyone stood there speechless. Then Tekin noticed something and went to the mirror. She's still breathing. He picked her up, carefully carried her to bed. I'll get some water. Why does she need water? And Garana comes in. He says, go look after the children. And then we start looking at Yuika. Why does he need water? She's still breathing. That doesn't mean get water. Okay. Then we're told to get card 79. Let's put these cards over here. 79. Yuika suddenly wakes up. He's alive. Turn him on his back. For a piece of his own shirt, bandaged up the wound on his arm. So he's cut on his arm. Seems to be self-inflicted. The wound's edges were rough, which made sense, given the poorly sharpened, rusty cutter. Maybe it's like a box cutter or something. Anyway, it's not the same knife that was killed, that killed Vaklov so cleanly, but it does look like one of the ones they found that were to be found in his hut, which was full of rusty old equipment. Tekin returned carrying a pitcher of water, so he did bring back water. He's happy that the kid's alive, but the water is what? For nothing. <laughs> mm, very suspicious. Okay, then Namira opens her eyes. She didn't realize what had happened, but when she did, she ran to his side and hugged him tightly. For a long time, she couldn't calm down, first crying, then laughing uncontrollably, all the time hugging the lad, who looked like he was about to faint. When she finally calmed down, we helped her get up, sat her down on the bed, and gently asked her if she remembered what happened to her. She said she couldn't fall asleep, she had painful memories of Vaklov and Lada. Long past midnight when she sat down at her desk, wanting to pour out her feelings in writing. That sounds like total bullshit. She said she needed to go out to her office for a minute, and now we're supposed to believe she went there just so she could write her feelings down? No. But now she claims that the same thing happened to her that Vaklov's spirit told us happened to him, that she suddenly got super tired, sudden terrible weight pressing down, she couldn't even look up. Corner of her eye, she noticed a vague outline above her desk. That sounds like bullshit to me. She could see someone's shadow, but was sure no one else had entered the room. Her body became increasingly heavy, as if turning into stone. She lowered her head on the desk in complete exhaustion in the last minutes before she lost consciousness. Notice here she says she lowered her head on her desk, but the scene of the room when we went in was her with her head in her hands. Seems to be a little different to me. But right as she's losing exhaustion, as if one of these creatures is draining her of energy, she heard Yuika coming through the window. She didn't understand what he was saying, but she clearly remembered that the weight pressing down on her became much lighter. Then she passed out. We checked the window. It was open, as she said, and there were footprints left by bare feet on the floor. The magician, who's part of our team, says, looks like Yuika saved Namira. His theory is he was willing to give his life to the attacking entity, but luckily it couldn't take it or didn't have time to. Why wouldn't it have time to? Maybe it can't attack two people at once, because when you're attacking one, the other one wakes up. Okay, so he's wounded. We removed his card. And then it says, we're finally waking up. We're ready to finish the game. We've got two new actions. We can search her office. We can question the mentally handicapped kid, 
and when we're ready to end the investigation, we can read 86. All right. So that's the ending event full of some curiosities. One is her claim that she needs to go to her office. When we all agreed we would stay in place for the night, it's very suspicious that she had to go to the office. It's a suspicious a little bit that the handicapped kid was allowed to go to his room or that he wanted to. Okay, so there's that. Now, before we reread anything, I want to talk about basic theories. Big picture theories for our case. We have encountered this bestiary and been able to look up in this book a bunch of different supernatural creatures. We've got the soul shadow, which looks like this. We've got, we'll reread these. We've got the mock wolf that looks like this, but can make people hallucinate. And we've got the imp fiend that looks like this. Each of these, and then we've got some poisons. Each of these, there seems to be some symptoms, signs that it could, that one of or all of them could be roaming around. This one is described with these bony hands that can come down and smash someone. That could explain the way Lada died. And then this one, which sucks the energy out of you, seems like it could explain how these people are losing their energy and feeling like they can't even lift their heads up. And then the mock wolf, we've got signs of it scratching the fence, possibly, and other people talking about them and so on, how it could jump on a tree and jump down and kill you. So, one possible high-level theory is that there is one of these creatures roaming around doing the murdering. And that we have to use the clues on the back of them that describe them and the clues of the murders to figure out which one. And that one of our humans, so, so what, one theory is there's one possible monster that's consistent with our crimes and that's either someone who's in the party here that is turning into that or that it's a separate entity on the grounds of the estate. And it's not one of our humans. Another possible high-level theory is that they're all here. <laughs> like, it seems like we've got different pieces of evidence that's suggesting all of these things are roaming around. So another possibility is that they're all, that all of these people are somehow each one a different creature. Don't forget, we may have other entries in the bestiary to discover. We have not, that we have not found yet, not found permission to look at yet. Still another possibility is that one of us is one of these creatures. <laughs> The evidence of that is that all of these murders have happened the night we arrived. We're told that there's four of them, Namira, Vaklov, Yukia, the handicapped kid, and maybe Marshika that have been here for years, or one of these others. But these two have been there for a while, and Lada. Lada, Namira, Vaklov, and Marshika 
or Eureka, well, there's four of them that have been there for a long time, then the others for moderate amount of time. And then the newcomers are Gorana and Mirad, who have been there for two weeks. We just arrived. And now the murders have started. So if you are making a list of questions, one big question is why the murders have just started. Is it just a coincidence that they've started when we've arrived? Okay. Are there any other high-level theories? So, the place is full of creatures. There's one creature. We're a creature. Like one of our wounded person or a mentalist. I guess there is one more theory. A key one. Which is that there are no creatures. These are just legends. And it's a human doing all this. That's another possibility. One is, why did everything get started? And well, for making a list of questions, why did Namira go to her office? Do we have any other questions that are lingering on our minds? There are a bunch of other weird things. This last attack, it's only Eureka and Namira. So it seems like it should be one of those two. And Eureka was our initial suspect. There's no, there's nothing that's. He's described in this final scene as saving her, but really. Might he not be the attacker? Wouldn't that be simpler? Sway says, any revealing details about motives for killing? Good, that's the other question. Why? Why did they start now? But also, what's the motive? All of the original people are being killed. So, that's a great question. So, it seems to me that the best answer to the motive, the motive question points us to a creature, not a human. Humans don't seem to have much motive, except for one. This guy, did he, is he robbing the place and has some treasure? Remember, we found a special key in his possession in his room. I wonder if he has discovered something, let something free, or found some treasure. But otherwise, it's a well-oiled machine here. Everyone's got work to do, so it would be very strange that you would be killing off the humans. So I think if you had to guess, you'd guess that there is there are creatures doing this. Anna says, my guess after yesterday was the soul shadow possessed someone like Yuika. Okay, I think the fat lack of motive, lack of human motive points to creatures. So, why don't we read our creatures again in order that we discover them? So, the first creature we learned about was the mock wolf, which is terrifying looking. Let's read what it says. Meeting this dangerous predator does not bode well for anyone. The mock wolf can imitate the sounds of other animals and even human speech. It uses this ability to lure its victims for a surprise attack. The mock wolf is incapable of coherent speech. It can only repeat sounds it previously heard. If you listen to it closely, the phrases it utters are incoherent and meaningless. That's what made us think of Yuika, the boy who can't really speak and just says hi. But you can't be living with this kid for years and not know he's a wolf. It just imitates the sounds. 
These fantastic creatures are endowed with an innate magic ability which they use to control their victims' minds. They create realistic hallucinations and the victims see their kin or nothing at all instead of a dangerous beast. All right, well, no one has claimed to see their kin. When an unsuspecting victim approaches, it attacks rapidly using its teeth and claws to hold and maim the victim. We've seen no one that looked like they got torn up. However, they can climb trees, which they use to hide and jump on their victims from above. The weight of a full-grown mock wolf can reach 180 to 250 pounds. Often a single blow would not, could knock you down even breaking your spine. So that matches a little bit what happened to her. If one jumped from a tree and landed on her, it would kill her. But her body is heard by Garana and Mirad, who rush over to it, and they find her with the basket on her back. That does not sound like something a mock wolf would do. Even if he was scared away by people coming, why would he put the basket on her? So I don't think we've got a mock wolf involved. At least that's not the murderer for the most part. And we heard wolf, Anna says, we heard wolves when we arrived and there were the marks on the fence. Yeah, so there might be mock wolves in this area, but they're not our prime suspects. Okay, next up in the bestiary. We should look at this book in case there's a clue here. Got a bookmark. Okay, remember this is this book belonged to Lada, the first person killed. Okay, the next creature we learned about was this terrifying looking thing, the imp fiend. Remember, Lada was out gathering herbs in a basket. <laughs> okay, so let's read about the imp fiend. Imp fiends are semi-intelligent beings that can assume either a bodily or ethereal form. It can turn it turn into its physical form or an ethereal form. In their ethereal state, they prey on victims weakened by disease or depression, whose bodies they enter and possess. So you have to be diseased or depressed to be possessed by it. But note now that this creature could occupy other people, multiple different people. Numira was depressed. Vaklov, semi, Wada, not depressed at all. Okay. Let's see. Sometimes they manifest themselves near the host human, as you see here who is then struck by feelings of horror and despair. That does not match our two victims, Namira and Vaklov, or our first victim, for that matter, who were drained of energy. So this doesn't quite sound right. Uh, as a result, they either die or kill themselves. Mm, we don't think the spirit of Vaklov killed himself, even though it looked like he might have. Uh, Afterwards, they possess the host body, which is transformed. The corpse dries up, its arms become elongated, its fingers grow bony and pointed, and its head no longer looks human. Turns into this, essentially. The transformation takes 40 days. So that's not happening to any of our current victims. After which the creature emerges from the grave, after you bury it, and starts preying upon the living. In this form, imp fiends can kill humans and animals alike, ambushing them and raining down incredibly powerful blows with their bony hands. The souls of imp fiends' victims cannot rest in peace while their killer remains alive. After years of such suffering, the restless spirit may also turn into an imp fiend, which repeats the life cycle described above. The only way to kill an imp fiend in its ethereal form is to conduct a magical ritual. If it's already taken possession of a dead body, the corpse must be burned as soon as possible. Imp fiends are afraid of fire and steer clear of it. So I guess the only theory here is that an imp fiend could have killed Lada. and then run off 
and it's going to possess her body from the grave. It's not consistent with the death of the other people, but if it's different creatures killing different people, this one is sort of consistent with her death. Although not the part about her being depressed or in horror, but just preying upon the living, ambushing them, raining down powerful blows with bony hands. Okay, but an imp fiend would not have put a basket back on her back. Now, it's possible that Yuida stumbled across the body and put the basket on the back after she died, but our two kids came running soon after they heard something fall, so it doesn't feel like there was time for Yuika to show up. Okay, our last creature was the one Anna likes as the culprit, the soul shadow. Let's read what the soul shadow is. A soul shadow is a very dangerous entity. It can spontaneously come into being wherever there is densely concentrated suffering. Now that's interesting. It can spontaneously come into being where there's concentrated suffering. Now we asked ourselves, why are things happening just when we arrive? Is it possible that we've got a a settlement of pretty depressed people, and in we've come with this guy who's barely hanging on to life. Is it possible that our addition to the group with this guy barely alive is what brought us up to like critical threshold of suffering in this suffering place? It feeds on life force released at the moment of death. Most often, it kills the sick or wounded whose death would not arouse suspicion. Well, these victims were not the death or wounded. Lada was full of life. Vaklov was fine. Namira was fine. And Yuik is fine. And our guy is the wounded guy, so why wouldn't it kill him? When a soul shadow is in its ethereal form, it kills imperceptibly by possessing its victim's body and stopping its breathing or heartbeat through sheer force of will. That does not match how people were killed. It does match how it drains the energy out of people, but then our people have their throats cut by a second person. So this does not match. Okay, it stops their breathing or heartbeat. We haven't really heard about that, just them losing energy. When in this form, it's bound to its place of origin and cannot travel far from it. We don't know about any place of origin. However, it can assume the bodily form of anyone it has killed exactly as they looked immediately before their death. So if it kills someone, it can take over their body. Once embodied, the soul shadow can leave its place of origin for long periods of time, up to several years. Okay, so one of our people in our camp could have been killed by a soul shadow, that took over its body. And remember that it looks exactly how it looked before their death. It can last for several years outside of its origin, but its abilities are limited. It cannot return to its ethereal form. It must kill its victims in the usual way. In other words, the way anyone would kill someone. But in either of its forms, it can control its victim's mind, literally paralyzing their will. Soul shadows can also emanate energy, giving it off to living creatures. This allows them to enter symbiotic relationships with people, 
offering them vigorous health in exchange for help in committing murders. So it's working with a friend. It can make a deal with someone. I want you to notice that, remember, this little kid is still emaciated even after years. They mention that, right? That, like, for some reason, he has a grown-up look, but he's not getting any, uh, he's not putting on weight. And then this one, his sister, is full of life and beauty. Do they have a deal? But they were with us at night. All right, let's see. It makes a symbiotic relationship with someone that helps it kill. Giving them vigorous health. It is rumored that some great warlords possess unusual strength only because they have a soul shadow around, which may assume the form of a servant, an elder, or a common soldier. It's best not to burn the bodies of soul shadow's victims as this can enrage the entity and drive it to start killing indiscriminately. Protective magic cannot kill a soul shadow, but can weaken it. So if there's a soul shadow walking around, it is inside the bodies of one of our people. And it might have a friend working with it that it's giving vigorous health to. Okay, so those are our creatures. DJ Moneycut says, hey, if everyone's accounted for at the night, then it has to be Namira the Kid or a monster. Yes, or multiple monsters. All right, so. Let's review what things we could do today. And let's try to make a priority list of what we're interested in. We have 12 hours left. All right, so let's look. There are rooms we haven't searched. I've put these little gold markers on all the rooms we have. So we haven't searched Rustique, the old man's room, that's hiding his agility. Um... Namira's office we haven't searched. But it's a little confusing now because look. These cards both give us options to search her office. It feels like we're supposed we should be it feels like this card should no longer be available to us. And that if we search your office, we get this card, not this one. This feels like maybe a little bit of a bug. Okay, so talking about offices. So we haven't we haven't searched the old guy's room. We haven't searched Namira's room. And we haven't searched Marishka's room. A little six-year-old girl. All right, so those are the rooms we could search. As far as actions to take, I'll just go through them as I see them here. We were talking about the bestiary and the creatures in it. Well, this is where we found them. And one of the things that we've thought about doing for a while is this. The other books on her shelves were of no use, but there is a binder of her personal notes that could contain useful information. We skimmed through it, but found only cooking recipes with notes on how to improve them. 
we could study the notes more carefully, more closely, in hopes of finding something of interest. So it's possible, remember, this is her bestiary, it's possible that if we study her notes, we will find access to another creature. Or nothing. And I'm going to put in my questions list the bird's foot flower. Who remembers what the bird's foot flowers were all about? Where did we encounter bird's foot flowers? Are bird's foot flowers a real thing? Bird's foot flowers were found in Garana's room, which we looked, searched through while she wasn't there. We rifled through her underwear drawer and we found, let's see, simple clothes, a shirt for Mirad, her little younger brother, his only change of clothes, and then under the beds, several freshly picked bird's foot flowers. Sorry, nothing under the bed, but on the shelf, bird's foot flowers. And the magician says, why does she need these? He smelled the yellow flowers. So they're smelly yellow flowers, but we don't know what they do. The magician decided not to tell us, and then we put them back. Then he says, how did they survive, this little girl and this little boy? And now he says, hopefully now she's in charge of cooking, she'll get her brother in better shape. This is the part about the kid. This, this symbiotic relationship between these two sounds like the thing with the soul shadow that preserves the kids the way he looked when he died and gives health to his symbiotic relationship. DJ Moneycut says, bird's foot is a real flower similar to clover. So I wish the magician told us why he was so surprised that the flowers were on the shelf. Maybe it's just always strange if you see someone with flowers on a shelf. Um, okay. And then in Mirad's room, you remember we saw a little toy, which we think Vaklov is carving and giving one to each of them. He doesn't seem to sleep on his bed. Maybe he sleeps in the sister's room, but I think he's scared and sleeps in this chest, which he's terrified of something that happened to him or fear of things at night. So maybe it's not so shocking that he does that. It doesn't make him a killer. We didn't search Mariska's room. Some people wanted to. We searched and, oh, we surveilled the boy as well. When we surveilled the boy, he just hangs out with his sister. She asked him to go to his room. He goes in. He stares at the, he's scared of the old man for some reason. We don't know. When he enters his room, he stares at the toy. We don't know why. And then he shuts the door. Maybe to sleep in his thing. We don't know. Eureka, who's now wounded, so we can't visit him. We did look in his room. Uh, we did look in his room. So we should have access to that card before it got, before we got told to put it away. It's over here somewhere. Okay. Uh, no, maybe we didn't search his room. Yes, we did. I don't know why I did that. Okay, so just to remind you, since he's one of our prime suspects here. Intellectually disabled. He does chores. He says hello. Mumbling and laughter. He does express feeling. Gives the impression he's much younger than he appears. Difficult to pinpoint his age, but he looks about 20. He does seem like he was near all of our victims. Okay. Now, when we searched his room, we found some very interesting stuff. 
First of all, he seems to have drawn all our people. And we think that on the left here, the older things are the people in the settlement. And here's probably the woman who died. And these are the two boy and girl, Garana and Mirid. We don't know why he's upside down. That's very suspicious. And then we think these three are us, including what, the one, Vykel, who's sick. Why is this boy upside down? Don't know. Okay, and then we see that he probably doesn't look like he sleeps there at night. He's got colorful rocks. A rock with the sharp edge lay at the head of the bed that he was using to carve. Maybe that's what he cut Vakla's throat with. Um, and then we see a little carved figure of a hair with a broken ear. All of the carved things that Vaklov gives seem the carved animals. Uh, he's given one to each of the kids, but this one is hidden. Apparently, he often took it out to pet it, polished to a shine. That made us think of mice and men, where he's a bit dangerous. But on the other hand, he doesn't seem to be striking out at anyone. So that was Eureka. And then when we surveilled him, this is what we saw. He had a fascinating ability to go at, come out of nowhere, suddenly disappear. And then we noticed he can climb trees. He's hanging out in the work at the workbench. Climbed up a tree. That was our initial theory that he jumped down on Lada and killed her by accident, we thought maybe. Is this our classic case where someone gets murdered accidentally and then the other murders happen to cover up the crime? Was this guy killed because he was getting too close? And we see him go in the stable. He goes to all lots of places without being noticed. Then he says hi to the girl. Greets Rostik, who's hanging out in the library. We don't know why. Uh, then he gets assigned a task. And then we could try to barricade the windows so he can't climb out and travel around. That action is over. So I don't know exactly what to make of that. Okay. Now, Vaklov died in a very strange way. His throat was cut. We summoned his spirit. I told you we were going to spend a lot of time rereading, but that's the nature of this. We summon his spirit. Okay. Let's see the scene of the crime. He's all bloody. We wake up his spirit, and he doesn't, he doesn't know what happened to him. And he describes that, thunder and lightning, someone calling my name. Now remember, Yuika doesn't speak. Could it be Yuika? I didn't see him anywhere. I heard sounds coming from the stable. Animals were scared. So a mock wolf... Could a mock wolf cut his throat and call out to him? He says, Yuik, is that you? No answer. I thought I saw something run across the stable. That sounds like a mock wolf. Something not too big. Could it be a wolf? I couldn't see anything. I heard the whispering again. So close, right behind me. Remember, the mock wolf can imitate sounds. The lamp goes out. I didn't turn around. I couldn't move. And then suddenly he feels super tired. Well, the mock wolf doesn't make people feel tired. 
All I wanted was to get some rest. So something's making him feel tired. It's not a mock wall. The goats calmed down. I couldn't move. Something cut through my neck. I wanted to scream, but I couldn't. So someone has paralyzed him. Then he sees Yuika running out of the stable. So from a meta perspective, this feels like it's too obvious that Yuika is running around. It feels like now Yuika is just roaming around, sort of ending up in the wrong place at the wrong time. But this this would be too, this is too on the nose pointing to him doing this. Unless he's being possessed. Something sucked the energy out of him. Do you think a human killed him? Now, when we originally read this, we thought poison killed him, which still is a possibility. Someone could be putting poison in the food, uh, sleeping medicine. Okay, so the magician says, I can't say for sure. His neck was cut. He bled to death. Something drained his strength right before it happened. A soul shadow could do something like that or an imp fiend. So both imp fiend and soul shadow can do this. But those both are known to weaken their victims. I've also heard that some animal poisons work similarly. And we did look up poisons. So someone could have poisoned him to make that happen. But why would that poison make the goats calm down? And we wondered, where is the knife that cut his throat? Well, if it was a mock wolf, you wouldn't need a knife. Just the super sharp claws. Okay, and then we read all of these bestiary things. So that was that. And then in Vaklov's hut, we found some interesting things, tools, rusty stuff. He spends all his time in here. We know he's carving out children's toys. Then here's a weird thing. Each of them was placed inside a small circle of dried flowers. Are these birdfoot flowers? Why has he done, why has he put children's toys in flowers and why are there more children's toys here? Here we see a bear figure with a broken forefoot. Who's that for? Half the toy was dark as if it had been partly painted. Are these kids that have died on the estate and he's dug up their toys? So have multiple kids been dying? Remember, we're assuming all this just started, but that's because that's what they've told us. If they're all in this together on something creepy, then anything's open. It smells like it's been dug out of a grave. Who decorates shelves like this? Has he been digging up these toys from graves instead of carving them himself? They're not bird's foot flowers, they're rue flowers. I don't think they're intended for decorations. The rue flowers in these parts symbolize repentance and grief. So maybe these, uh, he digs up, he, maybe he's given these toys to other kids throughout the years, and then he digs them up at the end to remember them. But does that mean that kids are dying here on this estate that we don't know about? Then we get a scene here. Do you see anything suspicious? There are the toys. Rabbit, bear, rope, I see. What are we looking for? Piles of junk. Looks like he'd been there for a while. The stone oven is more recent. He, we know he hangs, he seems to sleep here. We don't know why. Seems odd to us. Why would he sleep here? We could ask them why he lives here. Okay, that's another action that we haven't done yet, but we could do that. Okay. Now, Namira, we didn't search her room or surveil her. 
She ran the shelter before the war and earned her ward's unconditional respect. So she's the one that's been here the longest. We don't know whether she returned later or she stayed here all throughout the war, but she's in charge and she likes Ticken. Here's the old man. We didn't surveil or search his room either. Remember, we have one more surveillance, so one of these people we can still surveil. He's grumpy, except he gets along well with the girl, Marishka. Rude to everyone but Numira. He respects her. He won't tell us his life story. He looks weak, but he seems like it's an act. Okay, so remember, we can still surveil someone. We could surveil Rustique, Namira, Marishka, Gorana, or Tikin. Now, Tikin, we searched his room and it was very exciting. Tikin is the strong bodyguard soldier, veteran, but he won't. He's very mysterious. He won't tell us about his life, but all the girls like him. When we searched his room, it was fantastic because we found he had hidden stuff. Let's see. He wasn't tidy. Patchwork blanket balled up on the bed. A worn linen shirt carelessly tossed on the headboard. More clothes piled up on dirty floor. So he doesn't wash his clothes often. And then there's a chest. But there's also a floorboard. In the chest, he's got a backpack, loose ropes, and a braided flint, and some fire steel, like he's gone out looking for things in the wilderness, lighting a fire. Then he's got a well-sharpened dagger that could have been, is, matches the weapon that was used to kill Vaklov. And it's got a logo of this place, of this mansion, the two lightning bolts striking stone. And it's got a name, Rogwalad. So he doesn't, he's not supposed to have this. We don't know where he found it, where he got it, but he's hiding it. And it's weird that we didn't find any evidence of his weapons and armor. Then we search his bed and we find a key. Looks like a homemade key cut out of an old door hinge that he's hidden and we take it and it is right here. It's the crooked key. Clearly a copy of some other key. Roughly chiseled makeshift piece cut out of a piece of an old door hinge. Judging by how rusty it was, it had been made a long time ago. That's a little bit of a clue. Like he didn't make this, but he found it. And we can try to find the lock the key fits into, which we haven't tried to do yet. And when we came into this place, we're told that there's a basement that's locked, and an attic that's locked. We could reread that. So I am very keen to do that action. We also, at some point, made a cure for our guy. There was nothing else to do with it. I guess we're going to get it. We're going to ask be asked if we have it at the end. That's when we made our healing potion. Okay, we're almost caught up here. More actions we can perform. We can search the laundry, we can examine the kitchen, the library, or the laundry room. These are things we got access to very early. Doesn't seem like there's that much incentive to do this, although we have heard have heard a bunch of stuff about laundry. 
Uh, when Lada was killed, we did have the option to summon her spirit. We could still do that. We have plenty of those symbols. We did search her room. I believe that's how we found the bestiary. Um, okay, I don't want to miss, I don't want to forget this one. We can search her notes. All right, so let's try. We're almost caught up. I think it would be nice to keep in one place all the place with actions that we can perform. Bestiary. Oh. We learned about poisons. It just says there are spiders here that you could get poison for us, but if a human is making for it, making it, all bets are off. Okay, and then we have a bunch of cards that are in our history. Let's just quickly search through these and see if there are any, sorry, see if there are any we want to read. Uh, this is the end stuff about the two murders. Okay, so let's, let me arrange all the murders in one place. We've reread those recently. This was Eureka. This is when we interviewed witnesses about the original, this is our original murder. We went to see Namira, she didn't require, she didn't remember who was around. The two, we're told that the two kids went off. They didn't run into Lada, but Garana heard the scream. Mariska and the lad played hide and seek for an hour or so. Uh, this is a little odd. I thought the girl doesn't talk to the boy. Oh, Eureka is the lad. Uh, Jesse, does Vykel have his extra token from the cure card? I think he keeps getting an extra hand token after resting. The hand tokens don't refresh. Only the surveillance refreshes. So we've used up he got an extra hand and we used up a hand. I believe that's how it went. I believe that's right. Okay, so anyway, uh, so we're told this is the first murder. Uh, the morning soup was bad, half cooked. We learn Yuiko likes playing in the rain. Whenever it rains, he's running around. Then we finally talk to the girl and her brother. She hadn't heard anything. Wet clothes hanging in the room where we were interviewing her. She said she's now responsible not only for the cooking, but doing laundry. She had some free time. She did laundry. She brushes her brother's hair. Then she's going to wash their clothes. So we chose not to do this. So we lost that action. Okay, and then we've got the murder of Vaklov. The throat was slit. A wood-carved toy cat was nestled in his lap. A wood-carved toy cat. That doesn't mean much to us. His place was full of toys. But we know that's not the toy he gave to Yuika, because Yuika has the rabbit. And it's not Mirid's toy. But Garana or Marishka, 
We haven't checked her room to see if she has a toy. Maybe we should search Marishka's room and see if she has a toy or if her toy is the cat. Uh, okay, and then we examine the murder scene, footprints. It was carved out of birchwood quite some time ago and not very skillfully. Maybe it belonged to the lad. Am I the only one who wants to ask him some questions? We find bare footprints, some beforehand, small enough to belong to a child. Remember that in the very beginning, in the very beginning, we had a choice. Remember that we had a choice and we chose to surveil the place. Let us remember what we saw. Where is the card? So when we first arrived, when we first arrived, we had a choice. It turned out Crest was alive, able to catch up with us. Crest could be evil. Michael is ailing, but we would know our own friend. Deeper in the woods, we reach the estate with the small hut and the design, two bolts and lightning. Okay, so this is where we bring out the things. They argue about what to do. We decide to conduct surveillance and scout the area. We wasted time doing that. What did we find? Let's take a closer look at these. So when we surveilled the area, we found signs of a beast breaking in. Did a bear try to break in? Large claws, middle of nowhere, so a wild animal attack seemed likely. We heard a wolf howl, so is this a mock wolf that got in? Is it totally red herring or is that important? And then here's when we surveilled the place. Now I'm particularly interested in this. So here's what we watch. We watch an old man come out of the house. Wait, is this our surveillance? Surveillance is 11. Sorry, we did 11. 11 is surveillance. Okay, so here was our optional surveillance. <clears throat> so we're going to finish this up in a couple minutes, then we'll take a break, and then we'll actually get started playing the game. Okay, so we begin our watch. We see there's movement in the house. Okay, this is important. The goats are bleeding. A young lad came out of the stable with a goat. Is this Yuika or Mirad? We don't know. But he comes out of the stable with a goat. He cleans it. He starts playing with it. A while later, a girl who looked about six exited the house. This is Marishka. She says something to him. And they take the goat back to the stable and go inside. So I guess we're supposed to believe this is Yuika because Marishka doesn't hang out with Mirad, the young boy, youngest boy, but she does hang out with young Yuika. It just seems nothing to me. Uh, then an elderly man, which is going to be Rostik, 
emerges carrying a pile of rags from the hut. He takes the rags into the barn. Several minutes later, carrying some boards and takes them into the main house. What is that all about? So Vaklov lives in a hut. Wait, is this an elderly man? Maybe that's Vaklov, not Rustique. Vaklov doesn't really look elderly, but maybe he is. Small hut to the barn. We haven't really been in the barn. We were in the stables, but not the barn. I don't think we had an option to go into the barn. Maybe it is Vaklov they're talking about, though. Rags, I guess he's cleaning up, but I don't know why he's... Okay, let's see. This is when we walk in. Let's find out. Elderly man, I guess that is Vaklov. Um... He's like a janitor. He fixes up what needs fixing up. Okay, fine. So we did. That is Vaklov. And then he says, "Go to Lada. She'll get a. She'll cure us." Here's the part about the locked door. It smells moldy. Torches. We meet in Amira. She's counting supplies. She. Points us to a room, tells us to find Lada, other residents. She just says, come back for dinner. And almost caught up. We go to dinner. We clean our room, we sit down, and we meet everyone. All of us here do our share. That's how we earn our bread. Skinny pale boy who looked to be around six. That's Mirid. My brother and I pick berries and mushrooms in the wood. You've only been here a few days. I haven't seen you pick much of anything yet. Remember, Gorin, the girl, and Mirid have only been there two weeks. He says, even the old man says, even Yuika contributes more than you do. At least he looks after the goats. So Yuika looks after the goats. Okay, so that's a little bit of a clue, right? About the murder of Vaklov. If you'll remember, Vaklov says all the goats were freaking out and then they all calmed down. That does sound like Yuika has come in and they've calmed down when they saw his face. Marishka was quietly stuffing her face. She's eating. She's a little wary of us. And Garana and Mirrod, as if she was scared of strangers. It does seem like everything is pointing to Yuika. And then there was Wada, and we buried her body. Let's see. Storm. This is the guy. Something terrible happened. The horse kicked the door. All the animals are upset. And then we find Vaklov dead. Okay. Um, this is just the hut. We talked to Namira. 
Only the four of us returned. Okay, so here's the original four. Vlada, Vakla, Yuka, and myself. That's the original four. Vlada's dead. Vakla's dead. Yuika and Namira were possibly attacked. The original four. Everything changed while we're gone. We're trying to bring it back. Then she says, there's always been rumors. Some believe there's a treasure hidden here somewhere. Others say the house is haunted. And she looks around thinking, saying she needs to return to her duties. People believe all sorts of nonsense. That's, that's weird. All right. Um, let's see. This is when we run out and find Lotta dead on her stomach, the wicker basket on her back. Head unnaturally twisted. Here was witnessing, I'm uh, talking to witnesses about Lada's death. Here's Garan and Mirad. She says they didn't go far. They were picking berries. They started coming back. They heard a strange noise as if a heavy bag had fallen on the ground. So something jumping down from the trees. They ran and they saw Lada. She sees, she sees blood. Mirad came up to me Close his eyes so she wouldn't see. Your week is wandering about. Did you cross paths with Lada? No. That's all she could remember. We asked the little boy. He doesn't even talk to us. Vaklov says he saw the girl and her brother, said hello to them, and then Lada goes into the woods. That's all he can recall. What about Yuika? He don't we don't know. He ran off. Namira doesn't remember seeing Garana, but she was working on her chores. She saw Yuika and Vaklov. Then she saw Marishka and Eureka, Eureka running around the house. They play hide and seek a lot. Lada usually works in the kitchen, but she went to get the herbs. We couldn't talk to Eureka. The old man said the lad and Marishka had played hide and seek for an hour or two. That's what they like to do with their spare time. Mariska was hesitant to answer our questions, but in general, she confirmed everything we heard. Mm, a little suspicious. And Ticken says he spent the entire morning, morning in his room, but then we talked to him. We saw at some point that he had... Um, he was sneaking around. And then... Let's see... There were rumors that these woods were home to a mock wolf. Numira says nonsense, they're just stories. What if the killer comes back? We need to figure out what was happening. Is her death connected to her willingness to help us? If she was attacked by a bear, a mock wolf, or someone else, we don't want to run into it, so maybe we should fix the fence. Let's see, is there anything here we haven't done? No, we did those. Um, and that's just the fence we already saw. Okay, so we appear to be caught up now. A couple cards we had to discard. I think that's it, though. All right. Uh, let's see. Chat. Are we sure? Let's see. 
Let me, let me read up here. And it says, maybe Jesse's right. The little boy died and Eureka is sensing it. That's why he carved him upside down. John says, I get the sense the mock wolf actually wants to eat its victim's body, though, for food. The other two creatures seem more likely they'll just kill to free the soul from the body. And it says, Jesse's right. It seems Eureka just was near all three times. Too bad we can't talk to him. So he says, I'm going to pin down the absence of the mock wolf. John says, it's unclear to me if the roof flowers give off the smell of graves. Michael gained an extra thing. That's a question about that. Lawrence says, I'll pop in and catch up afterwards. So impressed with the game. John says, oh, this was the talk about the token. John says, I think it's Yuiko who's interacting with the goat. That was when we were reading up there. I think it, it is interesting that when Vaklov was killed, the goats all calmed down right beforehand. That does suggest that Yuiko was there. But I wonder if Yuiko is just not roaming all over this place. DJ Money Cut says, did the original four kill the rightful owners? John says, if an imp fiend is involved, it could have been influencing Numeria when she went to her office. Maybe it was playing on her depression. Her oldest friends are dying. She was going to commit suicide. Oh, that's an interesting idea. But how was she going to commit suicide in her office? I think it's very suspicious that she insisted on going to her office. Uh, but Jonathan, your theory that she was going to commit suicide because all her old friends are dying is very interesting. But how would she have gone to commit suicide? John says that doesn't seem to be the story she's telling afterwards. Good question. And why did the kid cut himself? That's a very good question to put on our question list. Why did Eureka cut himself if he did? He's wounded on his arm. It's a little bit suspicious. Very classic thing for a murderer to do is shoot themselves in the shoulder and be like, I was attacked. The wound makes it look like you're not the killer. All right, so an hour and 20 minutes in recapping. That's always the sign of a good game for us here on this channel when we spend a lot of time recapping. So we're going to take our first break here. YouTube says 13 concurrent viewers, the hardcore 13, five likes. We'll take our eight minute break. We'll come back and we'll decide what we want to do for the day. I'll see you in eight minutes.
Okay, let's check in with the chat. DJ Money Cut reminds us to answer the question, why did the kid cut himself? Okay, so I asked everyone to decide what your top priorities for the day. Jonathan says, let's start by looking around Numera's office, seeing if we can figure out why she went there. DJ Moneycut says, I wonder if there's another monster that would better fit the circumstances of the killings. Maybe check the recipe book more carefully to get a new bestiary page. And then DJ Moneycut says, do you have an explicit goal for the game? The explicit goal for the game is as a group, we're, we are investigators. That's our, that's our sort of job. And there was a point at some point where we decided, let's try to solve this since we're here. So we are trying to solve this mystery. I like Jonathan's idea. I like DJ Moneycut's idea. I was thinking the same thing. Is there another entry in the bestiary? I will add one more thing that's high priority for me, and that's the lock. <laughs> that's the crooked key lock. So I guess I would put those three things at the top of my list. Search office. Search for the key. Search for the key. Search bestiary. And then Numeria and Uik would be at the top of my suspect list, especially Uika. So let's organize those things. We've got Numira's office. Let me remind you that Uika is injured, but we do have a new option to try to question him. That's brand new. And we have two entries to search your office. I don't quite what one says. Let me just point this out. This is her card from before secretly search your office. And then the new item after she's gotten injured is search her office. Secretly search her office. We could have done that beforehand or search her office. This is the one that's newly available after she went to her office. So I feel like that's the only one we should really read. Feels like we shouldn't be able to do this old one anymore to me. So if we think it's all about Eureka and Numeria, we could do that. And let me remind you of one other important thing. We can surveil one more person, and it's going to take three hours to surveil them. So we can't wait till the end of the night this time. If there's anything we need to follow up on, we need to surveil early. So. I mean, Numera is, if we surveil Numeria, it won't know, because of the way the game works, that she's been attacked. So it would be like surveilling her early. So we could surveil the guy with the key, or the old guy that we don't know much about, or Mariska. Or you could argue that we don't know who to surveil yet. Let's start by Anna says cookbook, office, Eureka, and locked room. Okay, I like those. John says, I feel like the new search the office is the one we should pick. I agree with you. It's the one the new stuff that opened up, and we don't know why she went there, and it's very suspicious. So I do agree that that should be our number one choice. Quickly chatting with the channel though. 
Wasn't there a kid who hid under the covers during the last night? So technically he could have snuck out. I guess Murad was hiding under Garana's covers. He could have snuck out, maybe, or possessed someone. And it says, wait with the surveillance. Okay, so we're ready to take our first action. We're looking around this office where this last attack came in. I do think it's weird that she's so excited to see Yuika. It's not on this page, it's here. She like freaks out. Crying, laughing, hugging the lad who looked like he was about to faint. Like, she doesn't even know what happened. Why is she so glad to see him? How does she know he saved her? The ma magician thinks he saved her. Is it true? Should we be taking our magician's word with more faith that he's right, that he saved her? <clears throat> he was willing to give his life to the attacking entity. Luckily, he couldn't take it or didn't have time to. <clears throat> Should we be trusting our magician? It feels like the handicapped guy would be easier to possess. Yuika's parents? No. We don't know anything about Yuika. He came into this place crazy. Okay, let's take our first action after an hour and 46 minutes. Search Numeria's office 47. Here we go. Card 47. Our first action after an hour and a half. Let's see what we see. Two time steps go past. Eight a.m. The office was well furnished, and the furniture was in good shape, though obviously well used. On a wide desk stood a small silver candelabra, an ink bottle with a quill, and some papers. Coals were still smoldering in the beautiful stone oven opposite the table. The lavish interior was an unusual sight in a shelter for the homeless. A lot of things looked like they belonged in some noble's estate rather than Namira's office. Along one wall was a cabinet with glass doors. Inside we could see several key rings hung on wooden hooks, as well as two small bags tied with cords. The few books Namira kept on her shelves appeared to be on the subject of history. One, however, provided a set of instructions for communicating with Theros, the thunder god. The books didn't look to be of much value as they were copies of fairly common manuscripts in rather poor condition. We approached the desk and examined the records laying on top of it. Numira kept a detailed inventory of supplies. Apparently these were rapidly depleting, which worried her very much. The residents would soon face a shortage of food. We found many underwinds and corrections pointing to a mismatch between her numbers and the actual inventory. In her notes, she blames this on rats and detailed several apparently successful attempts to fight the infestation. So is someone stealing food, eating food, or is it rats? The records on her desk only covered the last few months. There were no earlier records in the office. Either Namira had started keeping records only recently, or the old records were kept somewhere else. We looked inside the cabinet. There were four rings of keys hanging here. Each looked like just like the one Namira always carried around with her. Identical sets of keys that could open any door in the shelter. The tide bags were filled with copper coins of small value, amounting to maybe five silver in all. Not much for so many people in the shelter. Without hesitation, we took a set of keys but left the coins. I feel like this is pointing us to the keys that we could have also gotten when we searched his room. I feel like this is an alternative way to get keys. So she's got a very creepy book and very recent notes here. That's a very suspicious. 
Reveal card 54, okay. A set of keys. Keep this keyword card with your characters. It may affect events that follow. Now that we have these antique keys, we could more thoroughly explore the estate. I feel like these are just alternate keys than the one we have. Now we can go to the basement, go to the attic, or search the pantries. And we can flip this over to look at the keys. Where's the key we found? Does this match these keys? Looks like a different key, doesn't it? I don't really match any of the keys here, does it? Well, find the lock this key will fit into or examine basement and attic. Uh, it feels like probably we could try to look in the basement or the attic and maybe we'll get a lock that these don't open, but this will. Where am I? Oh, I'm behind here. Okay, that was searching the office, the mirror's office. The next set of things that the chat wanted to do was, let's see, where's Anna's list? And it says cookbook office. Was the guy who had the key stealing food? Oh, that might make sense why he's so strong that he's stealing food. That would be a very minor story. Unrelated to our killings. That's a good guess, though. Okay, so, boy, it would be a real long shot to do this, but we could stick with our plan to Study Lada's recipes and personal notes. Does the chat still want to do that? Or should we maybe focus on these things? I think maybe we got to focus on the basement and the attic. Try to open up a new location that's hidden, secret, and has got stuff. So I think this is our best bet. Basement and attic. Are we on board with that? Basement and attic. All right, basement and attic. Let's just do them in order. Basement is 66. Uh, let me remind you, we're going to have to start surveilling someone soon. If we want to have any hope of doing something with that information. All right, but maybe we're not ready yet. Okay, let's do basement. Or should, let's mix it up. I'm trying to think, is this game trying to trick us in terms of the order? Where do you want to go first? Basement or attic? Basement feels more creepy, so I guess we go to basement. 66. Here we go. We walk down the worn-out wooden stairs. 
using an oil lamp to light the path before us. One click of time, 9 a.m. The cold, moist air was filled with the unpleasant smells of rat feces, rotten wood, and something else we could not name. With each step, large centipedes, wood lice, and cockroaches scattered in different directions on the dirty stone floor. Judging by the thick layer of mud, it's been a long time since anyone has been down here, Crest remarked. The basement was made up of several rooms with vaulted ceilings. One of them contained old rotten barrels and crates, which turned out to be empty. In another, we found something rather strange. A large part of the stone floor had been dismantled, and the stones were piled up against a wall. A wheelbarrow was perched nearby, its old wood blackened and crumbling from moisture. I don't like this place, the magician said, warily glancing at the damp, raw ground in the middle of the room. It looks like a grave. Something's not right here. Why don't you try to summon summoning the spirits to find out more, Cress asked. I have a bad feeling about this, the magician replied. This place, it scares me. I'm afraid I might summon something we would deeply regret. We can spend a mental energy to conduct a ritual against the advice of our mentalist. We have three of them left. We can excavate the ground ourselves. That looks like a graveyard that's partial grave that's partially been dug up. Or we can search through the pile of stones by the wall. So someone has torn up the floor and piled the stones on the wall. So I'm not sure why searching the pile of stones would help us much. Maybe some signs of what was in the ground. Jonathan says, I guess we should go to the attic first just to get all our options on the table. This is amazing <laughs> that we're that the that we're now entering some danger time. I am very tempted to summon that ritual. If we think that our our magician is the cause of all these problems. <laughs> Uh, maybe he's just trying to convince us not to do this thing because he knows it's going to reveal him. But all right, maybe not. All right, let's put this aside for the moment and head up to the attic. 50. This is crazy. And here's our attic. One time ticks by, it's 10 a.m. Quietly, we opened the moldy door and took the narrow spiral staircase up to the attic. The dust from our footsteps whimsically played in the dim rays of light penetrating through a couple of small cobweb-covered attic windows. It took considerable effort to suppress the urge to sneeze. We covered our mouths with sleeves and began to inspect the piles of junk stored there. Among the many old chairs and tables stacked on top of each other, there were also a bunch of rotten rags that had once been clothes. From the roof beams hung a tangled and torn fishing net. We found a box with a pile of books, which turned out to be the shelter's old inventory records. Some sections were unreadable, the pages stuck together and the ink blurred. Others were in decent enough condition that we could inspect them. We had to decide which records we wanted to review, the older or the more recent ones, or we could just take the time to inspect them all. What's happening here? Why are the inventory records up here? in a room that looks like it hasn't been entered for years.
We go into your office, it's all fancy. A book for communicating with the Thunder God. On top of the desk, detailed inventory of supplies. She's blaming rats. Only covered the last few months. No earlier records. Last few months. Last few months, huh? And bags of coins. Underlines and corrections, mismatch. I keep looking for something hidden on these photos. So she's got a fancy office, but she doesn't keep the records. Why does she not keep the records here? Is it possible we're in one of these stories where these are like all ghosts? Like we stumbled on this place full of ghosts? I just think you're telling a story of living here. I'm really worried that DJ Moneycut is right, that this is the pantry key. But what if it's like some super important key? Let's check in with the chat. DJ Moneycut says, wasn't this place abandoned for 12 years? Yeah, during the war. John says, we may need to pick who to keep an eye on now. Any suggestions? So in addition to surveilling someone, we can search someone's room. And we've also got these cards we can do. Let's see what the chat wants to do. I am, I guess I should get rid of myself here. Anna wants to read the records. John says, I lean more towards DJ. The old records might have been before they had to abandon the shelter during the war. A little less clear on what they would mean when they say recent. I mean, it's clearly all about time. Inspect old records, recent records, search through the junk in the attic. Some sections were unreadable, pages stuck together. Others were re in decent enough condition. Okay, I see. Not recent enough condition, decent enough condition. Ah. I mean, I feel like we need to maybe go all in on that basement. 
John says the bodies in the basement might be the dead children whose toys got dug up. Yeah, I agree with that. He's got such a bad feeling about a bad spirit down there, though. It seems like that could be our creature. That could be the cause of all this, some creature that's living in the basement. What happened? Why didn't it go in on it? I guess we don't need to do that. We can go this way. So... John says, I'm not against the ritual because it will probably be a cool scene, but I do think in one of the previous cases we made the mentalist do something he thought was unsafe and we did take damage. I mean, he is saying, don't, please don't do it. <laughs> uh, it seems like maybe we should excavate before we do the ritual, if we're going to do the ritual. A large part of the stone fort had been dismantled. Stones were piled up against the wall. Wheelbarrow nearby. It looks like a grave. Something's not right here. Why don't you try summoning the spirits to find out more? I have a bad feeling about this. I feel like this could be the end of the case if we summon this creature. I'm not sure we're ready for this case to end. I am tempted to do that ritual, though. I'm a little annoyed at our mentalist, to be honest. Like, several times he's not been totally... It's not that he's not forthcoming, it's that he's not, like, explaining things to us. Like, he saw those flowers, and he's like, that's strange, she has these bird foot flowers. But he doesn't tell us what's going on. He's like, he's, he's kind of aloof. And it says, I don't think it's a good idea to dig until we know what it is and how to kill it. Interesting. One of the creatures required a ritual to banish it, if I remember right. Yes, that's correct. Our best, we still think our best guess is the soul shadow, and the soul shadow needs a protective, no. Protective magic cannot kill it, but can weaken it. I think we'd have to find the human that the soul shadow is, but this could lure it out of its spirit, and we might know what we're dealing with. What about looking through her personal notes? Cooking recipes with notes on how to improve them. We could study them more closely. It could give us a motive or something. I don't know. What do you think? Should we stick with that? It might take us a bunch of time to go through it. It could be a total whiff of wasted time. Jonathan says we should pick someone to keep an eye on before excavating. Because I think that'll take double time. This might take time too. Well, who do we want to surveil? I feel like we shouldn't be able to... Well, I feel like we have to think about surveilling Namira, who's our most uh, suspect woman. 
because this surveil would get us the same thing as it before she was injured. So this is not like the new information about surveilling her. And what if we uncover something that we could surveil, but we've already spent it? Anna says, study the notes. I think Lada was onto the creature, which is why she was the first victim. I think that's a very clever idea. I don't know if I believe it, but we've been wondering about motive. And if motive was that she was onto something and she was killed, then her notes would be worth studying. I love it. I love the idea. That's why Anna is our top detective. If she's right, well, I always wanted to look at the notes, but... There's instinct, and then there's reason. And Anna has given us a very good reason to study her notes in hopes of finding a motive. I love it. Love the reasoning. DJ Moneycut says, Namira looks kind of evil. Mm, she kind of does. Um, okay. Let us... Go into her notes. Where are they? So he's here. Oh, here. Okay, here we are. We're going to do it now. We're going to study her recipes, which seems worthless, and personal notes. Ready? Here we go. Okay, at least one clock only. 11 a.m. It seems... Wait. Take the book. Okay. It seems that Lada preferred not to keep any personal records or diaries. Everything she wrote down had to do with cooking and preparing healing potions. The first of these notes was dated before the war started. It seems she used to be in charge of the shelter resident's health. From what we could gather after the war started, things started going downhill at the shelter. People got increasingly ill increasingly often. There was a shortage of herbs and other ingredients. Lada kept records on the remaining medicine supply, which quickly dwindled. She wrote that it was necessary to prevent contact between healthy residents and those who were ill. A note read, stop making toys. Among her more recent notes, we found one detailing the preparation of a poison. A side note stated that it proved to be especially potent against rats and insects. Lada made poisons? We looked at each other. If Lada was not killed by an animal, but by someone here, wouldn't they still have the urge to kill, Crest said. You think they might poison the food? The magician replied, I wouldn't put it past them. I could just be paranoid, but perhaps we should clear this room of anything that could be used as poison. Search Lada's room for possible poisons and get rid of them. No time spent. The rest of the stuff we already did. So I guess we're doing this, even though it's not of any interest, really. So here's the new keyword. We got a keyword poison. Oh, maybe we can use this to attack the creature. We took everything from Lada's room that even remotely resembled poison and hid it in our room. But can we be sure we took everything? Hmm. Well, that's not particularly useful, but at least it only took one click of time. 
Anything interesting written on any of those? Not really. We don't even know if it's poison. We just took everything that looked fishy. All right. Well, poison goes with cure. It's 11 a.m. Almost half our day. There's also a library we never explored that might have lore about the estate. But I'm not sure it has time to pay off, says Jonathan. Uh, let me point back to our... Oh, it's a good idea, Anna. Now, uh, let me point back to our general heuristic. When we have a chief suspect, which is Uika, should we... We already missed one opportunity to talk to him. Maybe we need to take this opportunity to do this. Anna says, can we cheat a little and expand time a bit? Mm, we'll see. We'll decide later. Okay, but I think... I kind of think we have to do this. Even though he normally doesn't talk. Uh, I feel like we have to try to get as much information we can from him. Since he was there at the scene of this place. So I'm going to take make an executive decision to question him. 73B. Especially because maybe it's weird that it starts out on B. See what happens. Yuiko looked depressed and hadn't spoken a word since the night events. We took him aside and started asking questions. At first, he didn't seem focused on us. But when we asked him about the wound on his arm, he started talking. I hurt myself with knife, so mommy won't hurt. Do you mean Namira? Is she your mommy? She's not really mommy, but I wish she was. Who wanted to hurt her? Or we ask, who wanted to hurt her? He says, The bad phantom. It came to mommy, but I came to her too. I watched, and when I saw that mommy was hurting, I climbed through the window. I made blood to make it leave mommy alone. It likes blood. It was so happy when Uncle Vaklov was... And then he starts crying, pointing to the stable. Does the bad phantom have a name? We asked, trying to distract him from thinking about Vaklov. Yuika shrugged and clammed up again. We couldn't get any more answers from him. Okay. Now. Unless we believe this kid is putting on an act, I think we now need to consider the likelihood that the killer is not human, it is not among our group, and is a separate entity, and not one of our tribe here, and is a phantom that lives in the basement. It loves blood, and it was happy when Vaklov was killed. He makes blood to make it leave Mommy alone. Now I think we might be back to having a soul shadow. Uh... We had an explanation for why the soul shadow... Remember we were asking, one of our questions was, why now? And we, I hypothesized that we've brought an injured person full of despair to the camp, and maybe that created a threshold of despair. And this spontaneously came out of the ground, maybe. It can slow their heartbeat to take their force of will. Assume the bodily form of anyone. Mm. Uh, 
Emanate energy, giving it off symbiotic. Oh, that doesn't help us. That's more trouble than it's. That makes life more complicated. You can't kill it with magic. Okay, let's see what the chat has to say. Namira was crying and then laughing because first she thought she was dead. And then when both of them were alive, she started laughing. Yeah. Jonathan says, I'd still lean towards the imp fiend. And Tina says, maybe we should suspect the game, give our answers at the end, and then continue. Just to double check, did you advance time, Jesse? I'm going to say I did. That way we get an extra time if I didn't. But I'm pretty sure I did. So I don't think I've given us more time. All right. Mm, that was talking to Eureka. Mm, now I'm not sure I did. But uh, I guess we could retrace it, huh? We went to Namira's office. That ticked time twice. Then we went to the basement, which ticked time once. Then we went to the attic, which ticked time once. Then we went to Namira's office. I already counted that. Then we went to her documents, which ticked time once and gave us the poison. And then we talked to Eureka. So actually, I didn't advance time. Now I did. It's noon. Isn't one of the old guys suspiciously spry? Says DJ Money Cut. Yes, Rustique is. Okay, so let's do this. We don't know anything about him. Let's surveil him. Why not? It's as good a reason as any. We don't know anything about him. Let's surveil him. Maybe DJ Moneycut has stumbled onto the answer that it's giving him powers. He's walking around, grumpy. We know nothing about him. Shall we just surveil him? Is everyone happy with that? In three hours, we'll find out what he's up to. Maybe he's downstairs in the basement, for all we know. Okay, so we're going to surveil him. And we put our thing three hours ahead at 3 p.m. That doesn't give us much time, so it had to be done. Mm. Yeah, why not? Okay, now it's 12 noon. We could, we could search his room first before we decide to waste a token on surveilling him. And what about Mariska? Nah, she's too. Although Mariska is the one who hangs out with Eureka. Hold on, I'm not putting this on this yet. I'm taking this back. Let's think about this for a second. Mariska is the one that hangs out with Eureka. But... Then he's friends with her. So if he knows about the Phantom and he hangs out and is friends with her, then she's not the Phantom. Okay, never mind. I'm putting it back. Who does Eureka not like? Is there anyone he doesn't like? No. All right, let's just still do the old man. Okay, that was still the right thing to do. Can we send Eureka down to the basement? All right, we got to focus on the basement. The basement and... Getting ready to fight the thing in the basement. So. What about this part about. Don't make toys anymore. 
Where was that part? Was this the don't make toys? No, it was in Wada's notes. Her notes about the old days. Before they fled. Before the war. Stop making toys. What's that about? Healthy residents and those that were ill. Stop making toys. Is there something about the toys that's creating this spirit? Then poisons. Stop making toys, huh? All right, so I guess the only thing in my mind that I am concerned about is this. Is Peekins just stealing food from the pantry, and is this going to be a key to a pantry? But it's an old. Like, this is going to take two time clicks to be looking around. I feel like... Ugh, I'm, like, really nervous not to do this action, this key that was hard for us to come by. Okay, let's... Maybe if I metagame it, I say that lots of players could encounter... The, could not search his room which would mean they'd never find this key. So that key can't be the key, can't be the super key, but this one can. All right, basement time. We don't have that much time left. Six turns left. I think we should excavate the ground. Or the old records in the attic, that's true. Okay, so here are two things we can do. What's it going to be? Let's vote. I can't. This is too much responsibility for me all in, all in one. What's it going to be? Mm. What do you want? What's the, what do you want to do? Everyone vote. We've got six turns left. We may need to fight this demon after we wake it up. So you better have enough time after you summon it to fight it. On the other hand, summoning it could end the game immediately. Where am I? Jonathan says, let's just get right to excavating. All of these are, all of these seem reasonable. Shelter's old inventory. No one's been up there in a while. Isara says, I vote, don't dig up the body. <laughs> DJ says, go right to the ritual. It looks like Anna says suspend time and gather more information. We're not suspending time in anticipation of needing more time. We're we gotta the rule with these time games is you gotta first play them as if time was real, and then you can bend some rules. Yeah, you can see me straight through here. Okay. Um, we're not ready to do the ritual yet. We haven't even seen what this guy's hiding. So I think we should excavate the ground. That'll give us more information before we summon this creature. Okay, this is going to take us some time, but let's let's excavate. I'm canceling the vote, or Jonathan. We're doing what Jonathan says. 
Anna made her decision before to look through the notes, and that got us some poison, which we could pour in the ground here. Excavate the ground, 48. Oh, this is a little nerve-wracking. But this has got to be safer than doing the ritual. We found a shovel and started digging. Time clicks by. The soft, damp earth yielded easily, and we were soon standing over a fairly large hole in the ground. Contrary to our expectations, we found nothing. Impossible. It's clear someone buried something here, the magician complained, plunging his shovel into the ground in annoyance. Or they dug up something here, Cress added doubtfully. He began sifting through the pile of earth with his hands. Yes, he shouted in triumph as he lifted up a small, dirt-covered object. Wiping it off, he revealed a tiny bone. It looked like a phalange from the finger of a child or a small animal. The magician took it from Cress, clenched it, closed his eyes. This belonged to a human, he said confidently. Hmm, so, Cress said, looking around the basement pensively. Someone dug up the remains of a child buried here and took them elsewhere. I'm not sure whether it's of any importance, but could you trace where the remains are now? He turned to the magician. I could try. I feel something when I touch the bone. It seems the child died in anguish and it left an imprint. So we can spend a hand or a time to track the remain. Well, we have three mental tokens. We need one for a ritual later. On the other hand, maybe we're going to need more of them, but Time is something that's important to us. DJ Money so cut says <laughs> children are the greatest treasure of all. Uh, okay, so this seems to be a child that died in anguish. All right, here we go. We're going to spend a mental token, keeping two for later. And he's going to try to find where the remains are buried. And time ticks by. Oh, my Lord. Time ticks by. It's 2 p.m. Grasping the child's bone in his hand, the magician moves slowly and uncertainly out of the house and onto the path away from the shelter. He often stopped and looked around in hesitation. This took a very long time, and we were starting to think we were walking in circles until finally we came out into a forest clearing. Here, the sorcerer stopped, pointing ahead. Underneath the broad leaves, we saw what looked like several gravestones. To make sure, we started digging under one of them and very quickly discovered a number of human bones. They were a jumble of different sizes and clearly belonged to different people. Among them, we could see small children's bones and the porous bones of an older adult. We couldn't determine precisely how many people had been put to rest here. There were a total of five stones, and several people could be buried under each. We noticed something else of interest. On each of the gravestones, someone had laid fresh yellow bird's foot flowers. Bird's foot on the graves. The magician shook his head, dumbfounded. Now I remember. These flowers symbolize revenge. It's almost as if someone's holding a grudge against the dead and is trying to take revenge on them. 
How quaint. We asked him if it was possible to communicate with the spirits of the people buried here. He answered in the affirmative, adding that such a quiet place was advantageous when trying to communicate with the spirits of the dead. <laughs> now he remembers how convenient, says Anna. Okay, bird's foot, which we found in Garana's room. Okay, let me pitch an idea to you. These are ghosts. These two returned to the shelter where something bad happened to them and have resurrected these people so that they can kill them again. Is that possible? I think, it, like, this woman has revenge flowers in her room. Why does she have revenge flowers? And these are the two newcomers that have only been here for two weeks. I think these two are, are somehow getting revenge on the rest. They're blaming them. The rest of them were there, seem to have been there for many years. Well, I don't know how to explain Yuika. Jonathan says, Jonathan doesn't buy it. Jonathan says, it feels more likely Mira died and came back as a soul shadow, and now Gorna made a pact to get revenge. So I wonder if Mirad is the is that why Mirad likes sleeping in the chest because he's been sleeping in a tomb in a coffin for the last 10 years? Now why don't we think it's Mirad? We gave up on the theory of Mirad when they were seen in the room sleeping when all this was happening. Here's the problem we face now. Okay, so he's like, I'm confident I can talk to them. So it feels like we should probably do this, but we only have two of these left. I'm afraid that we are going to need them <laughs> to conduct the ritual to summon the creature. But I think we got to do this, right? We got to do this. It's almost as if someone holding a grudge against the dead. Communicate with the spirits of the people buried here, multiple spirits. Okay, we're going to we're going to do this because I think we're going to find ourselves talking to these people who are ghosts is what I think. But let's find out. Here we go. This is a little scary. This is more than a little scary, but okay. It's got better than summoning the phantom demon. Okay, but before we do this, or well, let me let me spend this. And well, let me not spend it. So It's time for us to take a break, and then we will do this ritual when we come back. And at the same time, this is going to trigger, so we're going to surveil what happens with this guy. <sighs> okay, I'll see you in eight minutes.
we're back. I was just worrying. I was wishing in my mind we had surveilled Garana now with her revenge reefs, but we didn't know. All right, so before we resolve our ritual, let's do this guy because time is going to click by. So let's do surveillance on. Let's resolve the surveillance on this guy and see what we learn about him. <clears throat> Although he looked decrepit, the old man moved around the estate pretty quickly, and at times it was challenging to keep an eye on him. Couldn't figure out whether there was any purpose to what he was doing. It seemed like he was just walking around back and forth. In a short span of time, he managed to pass through both the house and the yard, sticking his nose in every nook and cranny. Whenever he ran into any of the residents, Rustique screwed up his face and made some caustic comment, then took off again. Apparently he got a kick out of this because later, when he thought nobody was looking, a joyful grin appeared on his face. Having made full rounds of the estate, Rustique proceeded to the second floor and headed for the library. He meditatively walked among the shelves, pulling out one of the books and flipped through it. Ugh. The old man shut the book and put it back on the shelf. I wish I knew how to read, he muttered quietly, then yawned and went back to his room. The book that had attracted his interest turned out to be a compilation of local folk legends and superstitions. I thought a man like Rustique would know more than anyone else about what was going on at the estate. Perhaps we should talk to him and ask his opinion. This sounds like if we go to the library, which we can do. <clears throat> that we might get another bestiary entry. Where is our library option? Here. It's the second time we've heard him hanging out in the library. I think if we go to the library, we'll be able to go to the bestiary and look up our creature that's really happening here. Okay, but first we must follow through on our ritual. Here we go. Is everyone ready? Conduct a psychic ritual. Here's our token. We only have one mental token left and a bunch of fighting. I don't like that. Here we go. Let's read what it says again. We asked him if it was possible to communicate with the spirits, all the people that are buried here. He answered in the affirmative, adding that such a quiet place was advantageous when trying to communicate with the spirits of the dead. These are probably going to be the people who died sick in the on the grounds 10 years ago before the war that Lada was writing about, but maybe they'll have some clue about something. 29, here we go. The magician sat on the ground. Time clicks ahead. The magician sat on the ground in the middle of the old gravestone. He closed his eyes and entered a trance. With his eyes still shut and face calm, he began to quietly chant a strange nursery rhyme. See the water, throw a rock, and you're in for a big shock. An old man rises from the deep. He'll catch us all, but you he'll skip. The magician pointed a finger at Cress. Name yourself, spirit. Cress stepped forward. The magician lowered his hand. I am Selina, and who are you? 
I see. Cress is talking to the magician. I am Selena. Who are you? I am called Cress, Selena, and you once lived in a shelter nearby, didn't you? Yes, we all lived there, the magician said, looking around. And when was that? When did you live there? Many winters ago. What happened to all of you? We went to sleep. Tell me what happened right before you went to sleep. I don't want to tell you that. The magician suddenly looked upset. It was bad. And it was bad for a long time afterwards. And now we are at rest and all is good. Please, Selina, tell me more. The magician paused for a moment, but then continued. At first, we lived well. Then the war started. Then it became very cold, and we started to eat much less. And then the adults started, decided to leave. I wanted to leave with them, but I had a cough. Aunt Leda said there wasn't enough medicine and I wouldn't survive the trip. So I stayed behind. They left a whole bunch of kids in this shelter and buried them. And they died, and now they want revenge. Was it just you who stayed behind? Everyone else left? No, not just me. Many others stayed behind, too. The other kids who had the cough. The elderly, too. They told us to wait. And so we waited and waited. We were very hungry. Everyone was so skinny. We didn't look like ourselves anymore. I cried and was very afraid. What were you afraid of? The basement. The magician looked frightened. When someone went to sleep, they were taken to the basement. And I never saw them again. Every few days, somebody wouldn't wake up in the morning, and they were taken to the basement. So everyone who stayed here that winter sleeps here now. Not everyone. My friend isn't here. She and I used to play together with two boys. And then one day, I didn't wake up, and I was taken to the basement. But not all of me. The magician's head sunk. What? What are you saying? Cress stared at the magician, but he was quiet. Selena. I just told you. The magician's voice was suddenly very low, booming, and formidable. His face contorted in agony. It was bad, and I had nightmares. I was bitten, and pieces of me were scattered. When Uncle Vaclav, Aunt Leda, and Aunt Namira returned, they gathered me. They gathered all of us, and now we're here. Now we're at rest. Go away. Don't interrupt our sleep. The magician collapsed to the ground. When he came to, we sat by the unmarked gravestones for a while, reflecting on what had happened. Then we left that place of sadness. Well, uh, this has been a big part of our case. So now we've learned that 
confirming what Leda's records showed. Before the war, this was a place where sick and healthy gathered destitute, and lots of kids started getting sick, getting the cough, getting consumption, and the adults decided to leave. And the adults included all the people that have died. Vaklov, Namira, Vada, the first victim, right? And the kids say, take us too. And the adults say, no, you're not going to make it. You stay here and wait. We'll come back for you. And Selena is one of them, of one of these kids. And eventually they start dying off. They don't have food. They don't have heat. It's cold. They start dying. Aunt Leda says, No, you can't make the trip. We'll come back for you. So who's left behind? Elderly and kid. Everyone gets skinny. Remember, this kid is still skinny. He doesn't seem to put on weight. And eventually they start dying. And when they die, they're brought to the basement and buried. Okay. Everyone who stayed here that winter sleeps here now. And this girl says, not everyone. My friend isn't. She and I... used to play together with two boys. Is it these two boys? Or could it be Mariska is the girl? Oof. She and I used to play together with two boys. One day I didn't wake up. And then they buried, and then a new voice comes. I was bitten. Pieces of me were scattered. Uncle Vaklov, Aunt Lada, and Aunt Namira returned. They gathered me. So they're saying when they came back from the war afterwards, they dug them all up and they buried them. I think. Maybe. So when the adults came back, which are all the adults that have been killed now, they dug up the bones and moved them. But I wonder if maybe they forgot to move one of them. One of them is getting revenge. We know this one has got the revenge flowers in her room. That makes her prime candidate of suspicion. I wish we had followed her. It's not Mariska, because look at Mariska. She's in a good mood, and she came back from town... Doesn't have a care in the world. She likes the old man. She got fat when she eat food. She's suspicious of strangers. And she doesn't like the boy. And we searched her room, right? I think we searched her room. She doesn't have a token on it. Maybe we didn't. All right. So... I think one of the people is still haunt, is getting their revenge on them. That's what's happened. One of them hasn't been put to rest and is getting their revenge. And it's a girl. She and I used to play together with the two with two boys. One day I didn't wake up. So I think it's gonna be Garana or Mariska, I guess, but probably Garana. And the boys didn't get dug up. Maybe this is it. Like maybe maybe the relatives dug up their kid, Selena. 
but didn't dig up the others. And now the others are taking revenge. I was bitten, pieces of me were scattered. I don't know if that means just the rats were biting them. But now we know it is all revenge and it's this creature and now we know why. Okay, so let me see here. Uh, so Gorana survived and grew up, but Mirid died and looks the same as when he died. I think that makes some sense. Uh, Gorana survived and grew up? I don't know about that. Oh, I see. You think she grew up and survived and... And she's helping him now. But then... Your theory then is that... If that's your theory, that she survived... Oh, I think I see what you're trying to suggest. My friend isn't here. She and I used to play together with two boys. I see. I was thinking it's Garana and she died and was buried, but... but is now haunting them. And your suggestion is no, she never died. She is just, has come back and somehow she's dug up her kid. Arrived at the shelter two weeks ago with her six-year-old brother. According to grandfather, her family's forced to flee from these parts when the war started. Three years ago, the father murdered. The mother died of consumption. She took care of her brother. Found nothing but ashes where the old family home once stood. Hmm. All right, I'm not 100% sure, but she surely is. Work. She and this boy are working together to kill people, but as some sort of phantom creature. Maybe the boy can control things. So the channel seemed to think, and Tina's leaving us now. John says we should probably go to the library, try a lockdown if it's a new creature. Okay, so. I think we have a fairly good idea of what's going on here. We do have the energy to conduct a ritual to summon this phantom, which we think is probably the boy or the the mirrored, maybe, I guess. So let's go through the things we could do. We could search through the pile of stones by the wall. We could try to conduct this ritual, ritual to summon up the phantom. We can search for what this crooked key opened up. But we have no reason to believe that this guy had access to that. We could try to search Marishka's room. We could look at the old records. The old... Okay, so let's think about this. Which monster talked about taking on the appearance of the person at the time of their death? Um, which one was that? Was that the Imp Fiend? I think we're going to discover a new kind of creature when we go to the library, is what I think. Uh, emerges, let's see, transformation takes 40 days. They've been here a couple weeks only. After which the creature emerges from the grave, starts preying upon the living. Uh, let's see, after years of suffering, it may turn into an imp fiend itself. Drain the host's life force. It's, I guess the soul shadow is the one that kills the sick or wounded. 
when it kills someone, they look exactly how they looked before their death. Uh, I am inclined to go to the library. I'm inclined to go to the library. But I think that we should also consider that the old records may have proof of Garana. The old records might have Garana's history. So I kind of want to look at Garana's records and go to the library. And I think the library will give us a new bestiary. I guess the most important thing is to go to the library. Jonathan says he thinks it's the soul shadow. It uh, could be, but if it's a new creature that we learn about in the library, it might tell us how to kill it. So I think we've got, I think that has to be our priority. I just worry that it's going to eat up a bunch of time. But I feel like if there's any possibility that it could be a creature that needs killing in a different way, we better go to the library. So that's my pitch. But let me give you your choices. We can go to the library to hopefully find a new book that explains the lore of this creature, that we're, how to kill it. Even if it is Soul Shadow, it might have more information on how to kill the Soul Shadow. Or it could be a red herring. Another good option is for us to look at the old records to see if we can find Garana's records. And then the last good option is probably to conduct a ritual with our remaining thing and summon up this creature to fight it. Although I'm inclined to just hope that we can do that at the end on our own. So what's it going to be? Among those three. DJ Moneycut says, I like the library. Jonathan Warner says, Bunch of sick, miserable children brings Soul Shadow into being, kills Mirad, assumes his identity, makes a pact with Garana. They leave for a few years, return for revenge. Boy, that's pretty convincing, <laughs> to be honest. So the sick, miserable children, when left alone dying, brings the Soul Shadow into existence because it can form when there's misery. Let me just refresh this theory. I think this seems pretty good. It kills Mirad, who's about to die on his own. It's bound to its place of origin, can't travel far, but it can take the form of the person it kills. It leaves its place. You think it meets back up with Garana and enters into a symbiotic relationship with her. That's why she looks so pretty. Maybe it kills their family. Remember, her history is the mother dies, the father dies. And then they come back to get revenge. Don't burn the victims. You can't kill it with magic, which is why we have physical might. That's good. But how is it killing these other people now? I guess it can somehow take... possess its victim's body, slows them down... I don't know how it's attacking Namira and Yuik, though. But maybe once he's hiding under her bed covers, he can travel. 
All right, so we think it's the soul shadow. Then you think the library is not worth doing, but we're not going to. We're not going to conduct a ritual on our own. Surely we'll do it at the end of the day. So I mean, reading the old records would be kind of fun to see if we can find evidence of Garana or Mira dying, and the library also seems good. All right, let's try to do both. Let's go to the library first. Time ticks by. It's now 4 p.m. Judging by the number of shelves, the library had once held significantly more books than were currently there. Lada took some of the books, the old man told us lazily, passing by the library. All the interesting ones. We decided to skim through whatever books remained. The inside cover of one of the first ones we opened was stamped with a symbol. Two bolts of lightning striking a stone. This is usually how noble families mark the books in their private libraries, the sorcerer said, opening books one after the other. The same mark was present in each of them. On the shelves, we found several tomes on the history of the Princeton. Another book was devoted to smithcraft. Several more books were on the subject of tactics, combat techniques, and the art of war. Lastly, we found a few compilations of local folk legends. That's what we want. Flipping through one of the books, we stumbled upon something unusual. It was an old treaty on the art of fortification. It didn't hold any great interest in itself, but the book was unfinished, and one of the blank pages at the end had several notes in the crooked handwriting of, an of a young child. My name is Nazar. We live here, me and my friends. We hungry, but not enough food. Everyone feel bad. Many people lie down and don't walk. We don't even play. Today, Selena didn't wake up and they took her away. Many were took away already. Borislav didn't wake up too. Snezka is sad, and she doesn't believe that Borislav is not alive and wants to run away, and I can't. Hard to walk. Snezda ran away. Today there was soup, but very little, and I was not given. Everyone feel bad and cold. I guess I won't, won't wake up, too. Boy, that's sad. She wants to run away. Snezka. Is Snezka and Nazar codenames for Mirad and Garana? Or are this, these just other people? No, this is not what I thought we were going to find in the library. My name is Nazar. It's just more story. I mean, this is the Selena we heard about dying. I'm just wondering if this person is of interest to us. Nazar, Snezda, Snezga. Borislav. But these aren't our people, right? Arishka. Wow, that's pretty sad. Okay, well. The art of fortification. Hmm. Does anyone think that these are our people? Varana and Mirad? Writing under different names? Looks like the channel was thinking the same thing as I was, but no one has any proof of it. Sorry, that's the view I want. We might need their real names for the finale.
Okay, but not mention if they if it mentioned they were brother and sister, I would be more inclined to believe it. Snezka said she doesn't believe Morris was on and wants to run away, but I can't. Well, that's why she would want revenge, though. She runs away. She has to leave him, and he dies. Snezka. All right, let's write down. Well, I guess we have access to this card. So is Snezka Garana. G-O-R-A. Doesn't not the same number of letters. Any sign that that was her real name? We don't really know. Not really. Nazar Mirad. No mention here of what kind of toys he likes. Maybe the old records were, will confirm if they were siblings. They might just have been close friends. Garana's bio is made up. I mean, what she says about herself is probably made up. Okay. Let's put that where we can find it. <clears throat> it's 4 p.m. We still have time. Is this what the group wants to do? Check the old records and see if we can find anything about Garana, Mirad. <clears throat> or do you want to search through other junk? The brother-sister thing might be a cover story. Yes, it might be. What do you think? Old records or search through the junk? Unless we want to hunt for the lost treasure. It does seem like he's found some treasure. Yeah, I mean, I I don't know. These are both. I I I I am tempted to do this. We do have two hours left. Old records makes the most sense, says Jonathan. Okay, let's do old records seventy six. All right, well, old records takes up two clicks, which puts it at 6 p.m. The old records were barely legible, so this task took us longer than we expected. They were from the pre-war years when life in the shelter was bustling with daily challenges, but was good overall. The handwriting in all the records, both the new and old ones, was Namira's. We read all her notes, skipping over the data on food stocks and other statistics. At the time the war broke out in 1389, the shelter was home to 97 residents, including 12 staff. We didn't see any names mentioned in these early records. Neither did we see any of Namira's personal thoughts. She stuck to diligent calculations and accounts of events. However, at the very end, we found a handful of important entries. November 2nd, 1389. Today, Vaklov returned with the other men. Their carriages are empty and they are shaking from the cold. The attempt to stockpile food failed. The Boches have already seized the town's supplies. We have nearly a hundred people here and enough food for maybe two or three weeks, even if we ration it. The situation is complicated by the early onset of winter and the fact that we are unable to move freely through enemy-occupied lands. The men try to hunt for food, but with little success. It's as if the animals are also fleeing from the war, feeling the advance of these damned beast men. November 7. Vaklov is sick. I suppose it's exhaustion and hypothermia from his trip to town. Lada has been treating him with some potions. I forbade him from working, and he's been spending his time carving out toys for the kids. They love to hang around and watch. November 16th. We held a long and arduous meeting and eventually decided to leave the shelter. 
Everyone who can withstand the long journey through the snow and cold will be departing tomorrow at dawn. Twenty-three people decided to stay. They're mostly the elderly and the sick. Vaklov is still in a bad state, but I cannot do without him, so I ordered later to prepare more medicine for him. Among those we must abandon are four sick children. They simply won't survive the journey. We will be taking with us only half the food. The remaining supply should be enough to sustain the remaining people for a month, even longer if they ration it well. I'm sure by then we'll figure out a way to send them help. I pen this entry to explain why I did what I did. Either we all starve to death or we try to save some. Dear children, please forgive us. Selena and Nazar, Snezka and Borislav. We will return for you, I promise. Okay, well, there are the four kids. We know one of them runs away and escapes. Selena and Nazar, Snezka and Borislav. Well, I think it's good we did this because it doesn't help us, but it does paint a little more balanced picture of the adults going away. When we talked to that spirit, it was pretty one-sided. It seems like the adults just casually left all the kids to die. But really, the lore here is much more realistic, right? Like they left them half the food and it was either everyone dies or they try to get help and come back for them. This seems much more reasonable. So I am glad we did that. So I think all the kids died. The girl that ran away is going to be Garana. And she came back and... Myriad met up with her. I'm still not 100% sure on that. Okay, so... Officially, it's 6 p.m. We're supposed to end the case. I think what we should do is let ourselves check this out. What do you think about that? Especially since we don't even know if it'll take time to go. So how do you feel about that? Shall we let ourselves read what happens on the other side of this card? And then we're about ready to end the game. I assume we're not going to conduct this ritual to raise up this phantom spirit because maybe at the end of the game we'll have a chance. John says we can check it out, but we can't count VP for finding the treasure if we do. Okay, here we go. The key was pretty large. It was clearly intended for a door, not a safe for a chest. It didn't fit in either the door to the attic or the basement, but it was a perfect fit for Namira's office door. First, we didn't think it was too suspicious that Tikkun had a key to Namira's room since we suspected they were hiding an intimate relationship from the other residents. But the more we thought about it, the less it fit. To make shift copy, didn't Namira have another normal key to her office? Cress twisted the crooked key in his hands. Maybe she didn't. The estate is so old, other keys could have been lost over the years. Maybe. Or, or the keeper doesn't know that someone else has a key to her office. Huh. And then it just lets us search which other cards could let us search. Just weird, huh? I guess, I don't know. I mean, he had to steal that dagger from somewhere, but it seems like that was just, just a red herring. All right. Well, we are ready to end the investigation. We're all okay with not conducting this ritual. Jonathan says, I feel like the basement ritual would just confirm what we know and give us a penalty. Or it's going to be something we can still do as part of the ending. And we're not going to search. We chose not to. Well, we can look at it at the end. All right. So here's our table of stuff. We have now come to the end of the day. Here is our card that tells us what to do at the end of the day. I 
I think this explains this also. Like, they don't want to kill Yuika, right? Because they're getting revenge on the original adults that used to work there. They're not getting, they're not killing random people. We found our motive. It was revenge. So they don't want to kill Yuika. Okay, so when the current, it doesn't say and when, it just says if. We've decided not to spend another night. When it reaches 6 p.m., finish taking your action. Immediately take the action below. If we end early, we get an extra victory point per hour. Okay, well, we haven't ended early. End your investigation and prepare to leave. 86. Okay. Our stay. Oops. Check Jesse. Should we take a break first? Okay. We'll take a break. I'll see you in eight minutes.
We're back for the finale of Mortem Medieval Detective, the Shelter Expansion. The channel has been talking about if we do the ritual, we could free it from the soul shadow. I was thinking about that, but then I realized our theory is that Mirad is not being possessed by the soul shadow, but is the soul shadow just looking like him? So we can't really save that kid. And Garana, we believe, is just a normal human who wants revenge. So we can't do a ritual to save her. Um, DJ Moneycut says, what's the deal with the other adults who are still alive? How do they fit in? I was wondering about that. No, I think we understand now. <clears throat> if our theory is right, what we've got is four original adults. Vaklov Namira. Lada and maybe Yuika, they worked here before the war. They left. And they left the kids who died. And this one, whose name was Svetka or something, she ran away. So she ran away. These original four, including the one who died, Lada, they left. After the war, they come back. They dig up the children's graves. They bury them in peace. And more people come to the shelter after the war. they trying to do good. But this one comes back and doesn't forgive them for what they did. These four. So this one and this thing, which is a soul shadow, maybe you met up with her or maybe she dug up his body and recreated it, whatever. She comes back for revenge, pretending to be a visiting girl and her brother. And now she's slowly killing off the originals and she tried to kill off the last remaining one. These are just people who are living in the shelter. They're not in danger. At least not for now. She doesn't want revenge on them. And she and this kid are in a symbiotic relationship because she's a soul shadow. He's a soul shadow looking like this dead boy that came out of the ground. I think that's right. So these are just innocent people who are living in the shelter. It's the original four that she wants revenge on. Okay, let's read our end game choices. We'll discuss it before I jump to any conclusions. Our stay at the shelter was over. We didn't want to put ourselves at more risk by staying here another night, but we couldn't leave without being noticed. As we were packing, the other residents gathered around. Namira gave us a judgmental look, saying nothing. Have you decided to run? Rostick asked acidly. What's the hurry? Your friend is still unwell. The old man nodded at the magician. You've searched every corner of this place for the past three days, Namira suddenly butted in. Haven't you figured out what's going on here? Tell us your conclusions. She grabbed Cress's sleeve. Namira, Dickon began, but the woman threw an angry look at him and repeated her demands that we share our findings with the others. We're all here now. Go ahead, tell us. Choose one of the following actions. Implicate Tikkun. Implicate Garana or Murad. Implicate Rustique or Marishka. Implicate Yuika. Implicate Namira or claim that none of the residents were involved. So we have to vote now, but I want to make clear what this designer. Sergey Minovich, it feels like this expansion is everything we wanted Mortem Medieval Detective to be. It's really firing on all cylinders. Notice it's not asking us what happened. It's not saying what happened. It's giving us a choice. We can say, we can decide that Garana is justified in getting her revenge. 
and just say, hey, we don't know what's going on. Goodbye. Good luck. And this thing will end up killing Namira. But we did go through all the records. And at the very end, we found these old records that were very convincingly put a more human spin on things. And Namira comes out looking pretty good at the end of this here. She says they have this long meeting. They're agonizing about it. But they're going to have to leave the children. They're going to leave them a lot of food. They're going to try to come back for them. And the only... I'm, she's writing this to leave a record. And she says, either we all starve to death or we try to save some. Dear children, please forgive us. And she did try to come back. It's just she was too late. So I think, at least from my perspective, I have real sympathy for Namira. I think she made the best decision she could. I think leaving the sick kids was the right thing to do. Especially since, remember, they were trying to keep them separate. So it's not like even if they thought they would survive and they would carry them, those sick kids were going to get everyone killed. So in wartime, so they made the best. She made the best decision she could, and the kids got left behind with enough food to hopefully survive. So we're not going to say no one was involved and leave her to be killed off. We're going to implicate Garana and Murad. So that's my vote, but let's take let's take an official vote. And Sergey Minovich has stopped in to watch the end of this case. All right, so everyone vote. Go on the record. What you want to do. I think we know Garana and Murad are doing this. Is it possible it's just Garana? No, it's Garana and Murad. He's the soul shadow. Where's our bestiary? Let's give him the soul shadow card. There's Murad. And there's Garana, that sneakily beautiful girl. We should have surveilled her right from the start is what we should have done. All right. Mariska, you go hide in your room. <laughs> Just go step out of the room. You don't need to see this. I wonder what we think was the deal with the basket. Like they killed her. They put the basket on her back. Maybe to taunt her or something. All right, so we've got four votes to implicate Garana and Murad. Everyone's in agreement. Okay. Here we go. We're going to stop the vote, clear it, and come back. <clears throat> Card 91. <clears throat> Not over yet. Sergey is voted. No, Sergey. <laughs> Sergey, you cannot participate in this game. We looked around at the others, then declared that we believed Garana and Murad were responsible for the deaths. We were about to explain our reasoning when the girl let forth an enraged scream. What the hell are you talking about? She grabbed Murad and pulled him behind her back. How dare you try to turn them against us? And why don't any of you suspect them of anything? She thrust a finger at us, turning to the other residents. All right, let's get out our cards here. 
That's us. We've just declared that she is the one doing this. The kid is behind her back. Namir is still alive. Hicken is still alive. Where's the old man? There's the soul shadow in the body of the kid. We've got our bestiary. We've got our poisons. Where's the old man? Okay, there's the old man. And then where's Eureka? He's still alive. Rishka is still alive. I just need Eureka, who's wounded. Okay, there's Eureka. All right. We might need that poison. So just keep it handy. All right, here we go. I want to get everyone out here for this. How dare you try to turn them against us? And why don't any of you suspect them of anything? She thrust a finger at us, turning to the other residents. The murder started when they showed up. Or are you just scared to say out loud what everyone's thinking? Is it easier to blame a six-year-old boy? My brother? Garana was suddenly holding a knife. She pushed Ticken away and rushed right at us. Spend to fight. We happen to have to fight. We've actually got a bunch of spare. Okay, there's our two fight. We expected Grana might react aggressively, so she didn't catch us by surprise. But disarming her proved no easy feat. She turned out to be incredibly strong and quick. In the turmoil, we lost sight of Marad. We searched the house afterwards, but couldn't find him. When the ruckus had calmed, the residents began asking us about our findings. Oh boy, Murad, the soul shadow, has escaped and is working about. What have we got left? One mental and two fight. Okay, card 100. Wait, but then this says also to flip it. Oh, there's a picture. Whoa, look at her. There's the kid, Murad. There she is with the knife. Why was she hiding that knife? Ha! Huh. She tricked me. All right. And she pushed this guy aside without any trouble. All right. Card 100. Or was that card 100? No, card 100. Your investigation is now over. We did it. But the kid is out there. To gauge your success, you must answer questions about your findings. Write down one answer to each question in your notes. At the end, you'll be scored based on how many were correct. Okay, here we go. Bonus one. What was the motive behind Lada's murder? Okay, question one. The killer wasn't acting of their own free will. It was revenge because she denied someone's treatment because her killer was afraid they'd be found out in retaliation for being abandoned. She just happened to be convenient or we couldn't figure it out. So I guess the answer is D, right? That they've all, they're all being killed in retaliation for being abandoned. We don't think there was, we were, we considered a motive of being afraid they'd be found out. So that's cool that that's on there, but we don't think that's happened. It does seem like B would be a good option, but they weren't being denied treatment. They were low on potions, but I don't think they denied treatment. When you say the killer wasn't acting of their own free will, that's not quite right. We don't think the killer was possessed. 
we think the killer was always the soul shadow in the body of Murad, looking like Murad, but it's not like they're possessing Murad. All right, does anyone disagree with D? No, looks like Jonathan's on D. Everyone should keep your own records if you disagree with anything. Question two. What was the motive behind Vaklov's murder? Jonathan wants my attention. Let me just try to answer this first. Was Vaklov's murder because he found out something he shouldn't have? Revenge because he killed someone earlier? The killer wasn't acting of their own free will? Retaliation for being abandoned? In retaliation for reckless behavior? Or we couldn't figure out the motive? I believe the answer is D again. Let's see what the chat thinks. Two could be E. He spread illness to begin with to the children through his toys when he was sick. Hmm. Is that what happened? The only reason to worry that it might be D was that the records were a little bit sounded like he didn't want to leave. Let's look at that again. Let me just read this again. Make sure he left of his own free will. Vaklov is sick. I suppose it's exhaustion and hypothermia from his trip to town. Lada's has been treating him. I forbade him from working. He's been spending his time carving out toys for the kids. The kids love the toys. So... Vakov is in a bad state, but I cannot do without him, so I ordered Lada to prepare more medicine for him. Hmm. But he's killed pretty gruesomely. It feels like it's got to be just revenge for letting, for leaving them. Jonathan is going to put E for 2, or D and E. Why do you think, why are you so, why are you thinking that his reckless behavior got them sick? Just because she said stop making toys? You really think that the toys he made were making them sick? Do we have real proof of that? I'm gonna, he was already sick, kept giving them toys and letting them around him so they caught his cold. Huh. That's interesting. That's an interesting theory, Jonathan. I'd feel better about that if it said that they, like, carried him out and he didn't even leave of his own free will. You have a good point, though. He was thick and they were hanging about him. All right, so two, we're going to see D or E. I guess I'll go with D, but E would work, too. I like that Jonathan is splitting it. Okay, let's flip this over. And that's a very interesting theory. I kind of like your theory, but would they blame him? DJ Moneycut says, would that little kid blame him? And I think that's a good point. Like, would they blame him? Doesn't seem like they would. Why does Garana's brother appear so emaciated? A, her brother's dead. B, her brother is malnourished and exhausted after an arduous journey. C, her brother is sick. 
D, something is draining her brother's life force. E, her brother doesn't get enough to eat. Or F, we couldn't figure this out. Well, it sort of depends on how you read how this soul shadow works. Certainly the answer is not B or C or E or F. So it's either that the brother's dead and the soul shadow is taking over his body. So I think it's A. Or the answer is that something is draining her brother's life force. But our understanding of the way the soul shadow works is it kills you and takes your form when you die. So I think that's pretty clear then that the soul shadow has killed the brother. He's dead. So our answer to three is going to be A. Four, how did Garana come to the shelter? <clears throat> She stumbled on it by chance. She heard about the shelter from some locals. Her family once owned the estate. Her brother brought her there. She's been there before, or we couldn't figure this out. It's interesting to think of that her brother once owned the her family once owned the estate, but we don't have real evidence of that, right? We did look at her room. She's got flowers. Yeah, it's just that she was one of the girls there, and we think she had a different name. So, four is E. That's right, four E. Okay, now card 92. Okay. <clears throat> Your investigation is over. To gauge your success, you must answer each question. <clears throat> so I guess these are the main questions. These The previous ones were bonuses. Now we've got main questions. So main question one, who killed Lada? Now we could answer Garana or a wraith, or a soul shadow. Who killed Vaclav? A wraith, Garana, or a soul shadow? This is a little trickier, huh? Because here's our fear that there was another entry in the book. Is it possible there's a wraith entry in the book and we haven't looked up? No, a wraith, a wraith is a different creature, right? That we know a little bit about. Vaklov was killed with a knife, says the group. So you think it's Garana, because she's the one with the knife, and maybe the soul shadow just drained the energy. And what about Lada? I wish I knew whether the wraith was in the book. Jonathan says the answer to one is C, and two, you think, is also Garana? You think Garana did both of the killings? 
and the soul shadow is just being used to suck the energy out of people and Garan is actually doing the killings. What did she hit her with? I don't feel great. I don't have great confidence in these answers. But we don't think there's an imp fiend and the soul shadow can't kill people by jumping on them, can it? Some great war wards possess unusual strength because they have a soul shadow around. So the soul shadow is in a symbiotic relationship, making her super strong. You guys wanted to burn the victim. Good thing I didn't burn her. Okay, so what we think here is it's all Garana with super strength given to her by the soul shadow. So our answer for one is C and two is E. Garana did both of them. Jonathan's D and E. No, you don't mean D and E. You mean two? Be two, the soul shadow and Garana working together. I wonder if we should say that for both of them. Okay, so the primary answer, I think, to both of them is Garana. Or maybe for both of them, we're going to put, like, with the help of the other one. So the answer to number one is C with the help of F. And the answer to two is E with the help of D. Is that what we think? Number one is going to be Garana with the help of the soul shadow with her super strength. She twisted her neck, hit her on the back of the head, maybe with the butt of the knife and twisted her neck. And then same thing with Vaklov. The soul shadow sucked his energy out and then she slit his throat. Okay. Let's do it. Here we go. What was the cause of Lada's death? Her neck was broken. Her head was bashed in. She was compelled to commit suicide. Something heavy fell on top of her, or we couldn't figure this out. What was the cause of Vakla's death? Cut with kitchen knife. Cut with the heirloom dagger. Cut with sharp claws. Cut with rusty cutter. I mean, we think it's this knife she's got right here, right? Holding a knife. Can't really tell what kind of knife. We didn't search the kitchen, so it could just be a kitchen knife. The heirloom dagger, are they talking about the dagger that we found in Heakin's room? A well-sharpened dagger in a leather sheath. So I think maybe it's not the heirloom dagger. Maybe we have to assume it's a kitchen knife. And we just didn't see it because we didn't go in the kitchen. So I'm going to say the answer to four is going to be A, kitchen knife. Now what about three? It's either B or C, right? But we think it's her neck. She did have blood on the back of her head. It feels like... But I guess... Something heavy fell on top of her. Is that our better answer? That's weird. Those seem a little bit entwined. <laughs> Something heavy fell on top of her, could have broken her neck, and she had blood on her head. Her neck was twisted. Could 
Garana described it. She said that it sounded like they heard a bag fall. But I don't know. What do you think the answer to three is? Like, why is her head bleeding? We know her head wasn't bashed in. It said her head wasn't bashed in. It said she died of her neck. So it seems like B is the answer. I guess B. But could be someone jumped on her from the tree. I wonder if the wound to the head could have been like post-mortem. Like you snap her neck and then in anger you like punch her in the head. Okay, I'm going to say for 3B. All right, now we move on to card 93. All right, couple more questions. What brought Tekin to the shelter? Was he looking for treasure? He had nowhere to live. He found the shelter by chance. He grew up there. He was fleeing from persecution or we couldn't figure this out. I think the answer is he was looking for treasure, right? Because he's got in his knapsack. We searched his room. He had a knapsack. He had... No, not his room. He had a knapsack. He had a dagger that he stole from this place, it looked like. Ropes, flint, and fire steel. So it's either A or he found it by chance or he had nowhere to live. What does he actually say? We don't know how he stayed. We know he didn't always, he wasn't always there because he's not on the kill list. He wasn't one of the original four. Should we say, are we going to say A? 5A. We're just going to guess 5A. I think that's right. He's found some and he's stealing keys. So he's looking for treasure. Although the key is to the Namira's office. Okay. What happened to the children who were abandoned at the shelter when the war started? You can choose more than one. Okay. Were they killed? Some of them were buried in the basement, that's for sure. Some of them died of disease, cold, and starvation, that's for sure. B and C. Some of them left the shelter. The girl ran away. I don't think any were rescued by those who returned. The only question is... We think the boy was killed by a soul shadow, right? So does that mean A, B, C, and E? As far as dismembered and eaten, uh, one of the... I guess that's true, but it's just by rats, but that would still count, right? Like one of the spirits we dug up talked about being eaten and scattered. So I think they were talking about rats eating them. So I think the answer to six is A, B, C, D, E. Bitten, Selena said. Does bitten count as eaten? So I'm not sure about D, but I think it's at least A. We say A because of the kid. We think a soul shadow killed him and took his body, was summoned up. So we have to say A for him. We know B is true. We know C is true. We know E is true because the girl escaped. And then dismembered and eaten. I think they were eaten by rats. 
some of them that one told us. So A, B, C, D, E. Jonathan agrees. Okay. Uh, so everyone should get on record and write down your answers if you disagree. In fact, I should keep you honest and ask you if anyone has different answers. Wow, we still have a couple more. Okay. Whoa, these two could have died. What was this place before it became a shelter? The family estate of a royal family, a community of Thunder God followers, a family of artisan nobles, military nobles, built to be a shelter. To this day, nobody knows the true story. I thought that we heard that the symbols were a royal family. But then we saw a book on following the Thunder God in the library. Let's take a look at that card again. The first one we opened was stamped with a symbol, two bolts of lightning striking a stone. This is usually how noble families mark the books in their private libraries. And then we also see a book on the thunder god but it's just one book but the symbol is noble family so i think the answer is well how does that help us there's two noble family in this entry artisan nobles military nobles should we say they're thunder god worshipers Look at the books. Where is the comment about the thunder? History, Smithcraft, Tactics, Combat, Folklore. Where's the book about the thunder god? It was in the mirror's office is what it was. It wasn't in the library. Few books Namira kept on her shelves were the subject of history. One provided a set of instructions for communicating with Theros, the Thunder God. They were copies of common manuscripts. So... What was it then? Originally built to be a shelter? We found a dagger with their symbol that point, maybe that points to military, says Jonathan. But I think I'll go with Thunder Gods because it sounds good. I don't think it was Community of Thunder Gods. Would they have been artisan nobles or military nobles? That's the question. Or the family estate of a royal family. A feels right to me. I feel like we heard something about it being a family estate. Oh, but they're all family estates. Maybe the answer is F then. Nobles. What's the difference between royal and noble? What's the difference between royal and noble? I don't know. I don't know what the answer to seven. I guess I'm going to put F if we don't know. But probably we could have learned. Artisans, dagger, basement. I'm not sure the answer to seven. Let's look at eight. Why are there hardly any new people coming to the shelter? 
Residents are afraid to attract the attention of bandits. Residents are afraid there won't be enough food for everyone. People are deterred by poor living conditions. Shelter has no contact with the outside world. The residents no longer have faith in the future of the place. People are deferred, deterred by rumors of supernatural entities. I guess eight, I'm going to say F. I think 8F. Let's see what the chat. Chat seems to have some idea about 7. The treaties on fortification with the strategy book says military to me. And we did find the dagger. I like it. I'm going to switch over to D too. 7D. You're right. Fortification. Very clever. Fortification. Dagger. Did it even say military books in the library? Smithcraft. Hmm. Smithcraft. Several books. Tactics. Combat. Art of War. Done. Good catch. Very good catch. So seven, we're going to say military nobles. We D. Seven D. We knew they were nobles. Now we're convinced they're military. Good. Good work, DJ. Okay, but what about 8? I think 8 was F, didn't we think? Didn't we hear at some point that people are scared of all the rumors? I think 8 is F. I don't remember which. Okay, uh, can we get everyone on the record for 8? What does the chat say about 8? Here are all my answers. In case you disagree with any of them, you should get on the record. John says, check Jesse. Do we want to pick one answer for the two killer ID questions? It's less clear to me if multiple are allowed without being told explicitly. I think I put, for the killers, I put Garana for both as my main answer. And I just added my little parentheticals for my sub answers. Okay, so if you have any disagreements with any of these numbers, here's the bonus answers, 1D, 2D, or E, but I put D first, whatever is first is my primary answer. 3A, 4E, and main answers 1C, 2E, 3B, 4A, 5A, 6A, B, C, E, D, 7D, 8F. Jonathan thinks we should be, don't do any little cheating, but with all these games, I allow myself to do a little bit of cheating. So my parentheticals are my second choice. Or with the assistance of. Okay, looks like everyone is agreed on every answer. Does anyone have any disagreements with any? If you have any disagreements with any of those answers, you got to get on the record now if you want to get credit and if you want to get MVP. That's how you get MVP on this channel. You disagree with one of my answers. Jonathan's going to change bonus question one to a B because Lada made extra medicine for Vaklov and not the children. So that was the motive for killing Vaklov. Jonathan is changing this answer. Jonathan is changing to B because he killed someone earlier? Bonus one. Jonathan is changing Lada's murder to she denied someone's treatment. I don't think she denied anyone's treatment. DJ Moneycut says, I was questioning bonus four as being D, but I don't remember why. Well, let's look at bonus four. Bonus four was, how did Garana come to the shelter? I put she's been there before. You put her, her brother brought her there. No, I, I think we think she used to live there and she escaped. So that's got to be E. 
Her brother didn't bring her there. It is a little weird that we've got this theory that her brother is a shadow creature. But, like, how did it find her? And why is it, like, it, it's a little... We sort of, this is one of these things that happens with these games where you sort of, at some point, don't forget to to make real sense of it. We've got Garana as coming back for murder and protecting the boy, and all of the symbols seem to suggest to us that he's the shadow spawn. But the question is, how does she meet up with him then? She runs away and escapes. And does the creature find her? And she teams up with it? It just happens to look like her brother? That's a little weird, like a little bit of a coincidence. Isara says, why can't it be C that her family once owned the estate? Uh, there's no, if we're right that she ran away, then she wasn't the owner of the estate. She was just one of the sick kids. Jonathan says, I think maybe the shadow, soul shadow already made the pact. It gave her strength to get better and escape. That's interesting. Huh. That's an interesting idea. But then you'd think maybe that she that it could run away with her. Okay, well, we've got our answers. We're on the record. Here we go. If Yuika and Namira are alive, which they are, we get card 96. It's weird that they could have died because we didn't see a way for them to die. Okay, here we go with our answers. <clears throat> Score your answers below. Okay, we said 1D, that's zero points. We said 2D or E, that's one or three points. I'm going to give us two points for that. Okay, three, we said A, zero, zero points. Is this right? Four, we said E, that's zero points. Wait, no, that's bonuses. Okay, sorry. All right. That, that was looking very weird. Okay, let me take this away and start again. It was weird because it asked us bonus questions first. So that's confusing. All right, let's try again. All right. Mm, score our answers. So we're looking here. So 1C which is three points. Two, we said E, which is three points. Three, we said B, that's two points. So far, all correct. Four, we said A, that's two points. I should have moved this up here. Okay. Four, we said A, that's two points. Okay, so we maxed out our scores for question, main, for the main questions one, two, three, and four. Okay, let's continue on. Okay, five, we said A, that's three points, max. Six, we said A, B, C, E, D. So we lost two points for A. B, C, D, E. So we didn't say F, so we didn't lose minus two points, but apparently A was wrong. So we got four minus two, which is two points. Question seven, we said D, that's correct. That was three points. And question eight, we said F, which is correct. We got three points. So we got a perfect score except for question six. We said A. Let's take a look at that and see if we want to disagree. 
certainly wouldn't be the first time we disagreed with a question. Where is it? Bonus question, bonus question. Bonus one, bonus two, and then card 92. Bonus four. One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, these aren't, these aren't bonus questions. These are the main questions. Okay, so main question, the one we got penalized for was six. This one, we said A. What happened to the children who were abandoned at the shelter? We said they were killed. The reason we said A, that they were killed, was only because of our theory that Mirad was killed by the soul shadow. So I'm going to put a little asterisk here. And if it explains that Mirad was not killed by the Soul Shadow, and that she just revived him when she got home, which is certainly possible, then we got this wrong. But that was our justification for that. So, okay. If you were instructed to reveal card number 100, so it looks like you might not ever have gotten bonus questions. That's interesting. Okay, score your bonus questions. Let's see what we've got here. We said 1D. We only got one point for that. We would have gotten five points if we said B. Oh, okay. So bonus one, two, three, four. So we said 1D. We got one point for that not the five points for B. For two, we said D, that's a max of five points. For three, we said A, that's max of three points. For four, we said E, A, B, C, D, E, that's the max of three points. Mm, I did something wrong there, didn't I? Two, we said D or E. That's one point or five point. So we didn't get five points there. We either got one or five. I put D or E. I'll split the difference there and give myself three. Let's see what it said were different in our bonus answers. Probably having to do with the kid, right? There's more, no. Okay, let's see what the bonus questions, what we got wrong. I guess maybe more to do with that thing. So question two bonus. Question two bonus. We said D or E and the, an the best answer was E. So let's see. Can you see that? What was the motive? Is this the one that Jonathan got right? Yes, Jonathan was right about the toys. Bonus two, it was in retaliation for being Abandon is what we said, but the best answer was reckless behavior. Yeah, the bonus answers are lined up wrong. It's A, B, C, D, E. So Jonathan was originally right that it was the toys that he was reckless about.
And bonus one, the right answer was B. What was the motive behind Lada's murder? It was revenge because she denied someone's treatment. Wow, Jonathan was responsible for getting both of those right. When did she deny someone's treatment, Jonathan? Was it just because she saved the medicine for Vakov? I don't remember her denying anyone's treatment. But nicely done, Jonathan. All right, so I am not going to give myself, I'm not going to split the, well, no, I am, because John says she made extra medicine for Vaclav and left with them not caring for children. Very interesting. Okay. Maybe that's why they punched her in the head afterwards. All right, so bonus, we did not get, I did not get Max Thor. But Jonathan did. Okay, so what's our score here? 3, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 18, 21, 22, 25, 28, 31 for me. Jonathan should have gotten some more points. Those bonuses were worth a lot. Okay, now it says, if you wish to proceed to the ending and discover all the secrets, We'll flip the card. All right, let's see what we've got here. Personal diary. We don't, this is the one keyword we don't have. August 30th, 1404. More than a year has passed now, but my memory of events has not faded. Every time I look back, I think of Garana's face. It was she who murdered Lada and Vaklov without any pity, giving their life force to the evil entity in the guise of her brother. Still surprised that neither Lada nor Vaklov nor Namira recognize Mirad as the very same boy Baroslav that they abandoned at the shelter a dozen years ago. Perhaps the Baroslav they remembered wasn't so emaciated. It is not for us to judge Namira's choice all those years ago to leave some of the infected children and try to save the others. Garana thought Lada could have helped them, but instead gave all the medicine to the adults. That's why she sentenced the women to death, the woman to death. Vaklov, on the other hand, had been first to get sick, and Garana believed that when he had carved the toy figures for the children, he had passed on his illness to them. Whether or not it was true, she killed him for this error. Vaklov believed himself responsible, and his guilt burned in him till his final breath. Okay. Um, so, for sure, I'm going to agree that Jonathan was right about why they killed Vaklov for being reckless. And then I guess, in the same sense, you could read it as, we're not really being asked whether Lada really held, the, held medicine back from them, but that's their motive for it. I think that one's a little iffier to take the the score on. I really think that I'm not sure there's evidence that whether it was because they left or because they denied treatment, but because Jonathan figured out, we're not going to give ourselves any bonus points for that. However, I think we are going to give ourselves, we are not going to penalize ourselves for saying that the kids were killed. Because I think this confirms our theory of the life force to the evil entity that killed her brother. So assuming this is a soul shadow, that thing did kill the brother. And we shouldn't have been penalized points for saying that the thing killed it. Bonus one and two and the two killer ID questions should have said select all that apply. I think that makes sense. I'm going to give myself plus two points, though, for saying that the kids were 
part one of them was killed because I think this is telling us that our theory of what happened to the brother was killed because that's how he looks like him. He killed him in that state. So I'm going to make my score 33. So if you scored yourself minus two on question six, because you said the kid was killed, the kids were partially killed, you should give yourself a bonus. You said A and then subtracted two points. You should give yourself a plus two points for that, I think. Still, Jonathan got the best score. Jonathan, what's your total score now? Okay, did we find Massacre? No. I'm not sure why not. So we get card 98. In any event, Grana and Little Mirad, whose real names were Shnezka and Borisov, which we figured out, it should have asked us that, had been abandoned at the shelter. They would have succumbed like the others had supernatural forces not intervened. The residents left behind were cold, sick, and dying. Worst of all, their terrible hunger reduced them to the unimaginable cannibalism. The concentration of their desperate fear and suffering gave rise to an evil entity. That was the theory the group came up with, not me. Someone in the chat was very clever. To an evil entity known as a soul shadow. It began to feed on the life energy of the dying, and it took the life of little Borislav. 100% confirmed that the bonus answer for six should have included A. Little tiniest bug in the game. Okay. It fed on the, it gave rise to a soul shadow, which fed on the energy of the dying, gaining strength. After it took the life of Borislav, it decided to leave the estate in his form. The shapeshifter went to the dead boy's sister. This is the part we talked about as being a little coincidental weird, but he matched up with her. Convinced her to run away together. It needed Schneska to act as its murder weapon. The girl believed her brother was alive. Though he grew no older over the next 12 years, her mind refused to admit the truth. She became exactly what the soul shadow wanted her to be. They must have taken so many lives we'll never know about. They were symbiotic, just like the soul shadow lore told us about. I recently heard a rumor that despite the events we witnessed, the shelter's residents didn't give up, decided to stay and revive the place. I have no doubt they will succeed under Namira's guidance. Ticken gave up on finding the family treasure. Now he instead helps find folk in need of a place to stay. I've even heard the viceroy of a nearby town has agreed to send them supplies. I am less certain of what happened to Garana and Mirad after we left. Rumor has it, Nimira was able to reconcile with the girl who recognized the horror of what she'd done while under the Soul Shadow's influence. I don't believe it. She stayed at the shelter, taking on latest duties in the hope of making amends. I was glad to hear that, though I'm not sure if I believe it. As for the soul shadow, it hasn't been seen since we left. We told the residents everything we knew about the creature in case it ever returned. Add five points to your final score for achieving a very good ending. Okay, plus five. So now I've got a score of 38, which is what most of us will have. Only Jonathan will have a higher score. Um, so Jonathan has got 44. I have 38 here, something like that. 43. Uh, okay, we do have the keyword cure. Remember, we built a cure for ourselves here. So we get to read card 74. Look at this place. They're rebuilding it. Good for them. Was it a mistake for us to stay at the shelter? I don't think so. When we left, our companion 
was still weak, and I worried his illness would return. Fortunately, his recovery continued unabated over the following few days, and we were safely on our way. Who knows what would have happened to us had we not found Namira's shelter. Add three points to your score for curing your companion. If you have any wound tokens, lose one point for each of them. That's if we did that ritual. Okay, so we get plus three points. So now I'm at 41. If you ended your investigation before 6 p.m., no. If you have the keyword sign, add two points. We don't. Now gauge your success. So we're right at the end there. We're at 34 plus points. I have 41. Jonathan has 47. So awesome, you mastered the storyline. Uh, DJ says, so the answer to the question about how she found the estate wasn't that her brother bought her, brought her? No. It was that she lived there. She didn't have to... She didn't find the estate because her brother brought her. The, the, it does sound like the spirit wanted her to come back. So maybe that would have counted for a bit of an answer, too. Okay. Well... That is the end of the official scenario. We did great. No matter how you came down, we got the best outcome. We didn't need the poison. And we didn't conduct the final ritual. Maybe when we come back, we will check it out. The table is filled with cards. These are the cards we never looked at. A huge stack. I am curious to check out what this ritual was in the basement. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take a break. We're going to take a full eight minute break because we've played for an hour here. We've been playing for four hours and 40 minutes. That means a total of about 10 hours, both sessions. We're going to take an eight minute break here. Then we're going to come back. We're going to talk about our thoughts on the game. I want to hear your thoughts. I have some thoughts. And then we're going to do that ritual in the basement and see what happens. And then if we want to quickly look through some cards to see what stuff we missed, we'll do that. But mainly I want to hear your thoughts on the game. Your favorite elements, overall thoughts, least favorite elements, if we have some constructive criticism. We had a lot of constructive criticism when we played through the main box of cases. Anyway, I want to hear your thoughts when we come back in eight minutes.
Okay, we're back to give our final thoughts on Mortem Medieval Detective, the Shelter standalone expansion, which came in this small little box. And this was a very big adventure in a small box. Uh, the table can't contain all the cards we saw. Beautiful art, very creepy, supernatural world. It is really hard to think of anything that went wrong here. Everything went right. And there's a lot to talk about. Let's check in with the chat before I give some thoughts here. Um, Jonathan says, pretty great scenario. Really enjoy the setting, little outpost in Dangerous Wild. It's uncertain if we're really facing supernatural threats or not. Great moments like deciding to burn or bury the body. Sergey was explaining question six answer in the original Russian. It was a little bit different. John says it was more of a pure mystery than some of the cases I remember from the base game. We personally had a great arc. We were convinced it was weak at the start. Slowly that blew up in our face. It took us the end to really figure out what happened. John says, I do think you could make some wrong decisions without really making bad reasoning and maybe get some people killed. But it's a horror story, so I don't think that's there's anything wrong with that. I agree with that completely. DJ Moneycut says, really fun. Time limit could be eased a little bit to let us see more and it would still be challenging. I agree with that. Jonathan Warner says, some minor nitpicks. If you really cared about the campaign scenario, it didn't really carry that forward. John says, like Jesse said, I do think you could make some bad decisions if you couldn't reason about the uh, same thing Jonathan's saying before horror scenario. I think that's the right answer. Sergey's explaining 25 and 25B. Sergey says, the only difference should be in the design of the fence. Perhaps the illustration was not correct in the English version. Well, that's what we sort of was lo were looking for, whether they were building a fence, whether we could see the fence. But we can't really see any difference. Can't really see any difference in the fence. It looked the same. But it doesn't really matter. We didn't worry that anything went wrong. It was just going to be a little fence, so it doesn't matter. What about 26? 26 had a B as well. Any change there? No. Not that I can see. Doesn't matter. Had no, had no impact. Okay, <laughs> let me talk about this a little bit more. Um, so I'll have to record another video for this. I think, um, Sergei Medovich, let's get his name, Minovich, let's get it properly out here. Um, Sergei Minovich, and where is our original Mortem Medieval Detective? It's behind me right there, this purple box right there. Um, so we played Mortem Medieval Detective two years ago. Allow me to talk about this a little bit. And, um, there were lots of cool ideas there. And Sergey joined us for one of the playthroughs at a point where we were saying that it wasn't quite working for us. And Sergey was very nice about it, was not upset, was not offended, took it in stride. And I think it would be much harder for me if I designed a game. It, it has to be hard to watch people play it and worry about if they're not, if it's not working for them, if they're not on the right wavelength. We played three cases. The third case was quite compelling, had some very creepy story that I really liked. Some of the other cases we had some criticisms about. And I recorded a review. I don't remember what my bottom line take home point of the review was. There were lots of good parts about it, but 
lots of criticism. And it's clear I'm going to have to record a little follow-up video now, because even in the years that have passed since playing Morta Medieval Detective, um, Jonathan says, I still think your bottom line was still pretty positive for the base game. Okay, good. I probably said I wanted to play more of it, too, because the third case was had this creepy story of this magical item. And I think the first case didn't have much magic in it and stuff. Anyway, point was, um, Jonathan says I was pretty positive about it in the end. But in the time since playing of it, I, I sort of developed a little bit of nostalgia for it. I, I, I missed it. And I think part of that is because there is something special about a detective game with a little bit of supernatural to it. And there's very little of it. There's this one, there's Mythos Tales, there's Bureau of Investigation. And those are pretty special. It's hard to get that balance right. And some people don't like that. And one of the reasons some people don't like it is they feel like once you throw the supernatural in, anything is possible and you sort of lose the ability to reason. I think this case proves that wrong. And I want to circle back to that in a minute, but let me finish up my thoughts here. This was an amazing case. You, this is, you can get this standalone as a standalone little box for $15 to $20. I think it's on Amazon now for $20. And this is a lot of really good game for $20. I really would recommend this. And it does feel like a proper horror, creepy, scary story with fantastic art that's creepy and scary. The whole story is creepy, but human. Like, we were worried about the kids, and then we read these diary entries about when they had to leave the kids. It's a little bit of adult uh, mixed in here. And it's a very deft balancing of real human and supernatural. And we played five hours yesterday, and when we started today's session, we started out with some theories, and one was that it's completely human, no supernatural, and it's a human doing these killings, trying to make it look like these creatures. And then the other idea was that these Everyone was the creatures. There were so many ideas that we had to consider because it was a supernatural world. And we went through a dozen different theories. Right? And that's one of the most enjoyable aspects of any of these games we play. When the group chews through theories one after the other during the progression of the game over the 10 hours... We move from theory to theory. We have a theory, then it gets disproved. We have to shift and adjust and move to another one. And you might worry with the supernatural world that anything is possible, but really it wasn't the case because there was enough grounding of everything that we were able to use logic to piece it together. Um... But it was fascinating all the different theories we went through. First, we thought it was the one guy, and it made sense. And then we suspected this kid early on, he was creepy. But it wasn't good enough to suspect him. And right early on, this girl looking beautiful completely tricked me into not suspecting her. But their brother and sister, that pulled things in. Everyone had relationships with each other. We were in this small, confined, dangerous estate. The danger was pal <coughs> palpable. Danger to us and danger to each other. We got to spend a lot of time with them. We got to choose which room we wanted to search, which person we wanted to follow. Those were great decisions. The tension of time and limited resources 
and limited ability to do one thing at a time. We could search one room at a time, one per day. That works very well. And you can see how well this multi-day event system works in a dynamic world where things change. We had to worry about people dying on us. After the first day, we knew people are going to be dying. If we want to search, if we want to surveil someone, we may have to do it before they die. But there was so much generous content here that when people died, we got to talk to witness statements. We got to still search their room. The game really kept opening up interesting choices for us with limited options. There were lots of times when we really agonized over what to do. We wanted to gain more information about the bestiary stuff. These were really wonderful. These bestiary documents, which told us about these weird creatures in this weird world. I'm not sure we've played a game that's done a better job of creating its own little weird, creepy, supernatural world than this. And that's how I felt a little bit about the last case in the base box of Mortem Medieval Detective. There was some very cool lore and creatures in that last case. And here, these were scary. And it was an interesting decision to make them like... There were signs of all of them. There was times when I thought they're all running around here. But it was really the combination of the supernatural was at play, but also very real human personalities with their own motives and stuff. So it was like, we really had to deal with real human psychology and the supernatural at the same time. And in fact, that was what the case was all about, right? The case was all about this woman wasn't supernatural at all. She just wanted real revenge for this real sad situation. But then she teamed up with the creature. That was pretty cool. And a little throwing suspicion on the handicap guy. All of the art was great. The resources were handled, handled great. And it's really a strange shift from the other cases in that exploration played such a big role in the base cases, but not here at all. I love the mechanic where we decide where to sleep. That's a very interesting thing. And they all, it sometimes has a little shift. I thought the ending was handled very well. There was a little talk in the channel about whether the questions were weird. I love having lots of questions with little points. Uh, the fact that the bonuses came first and were aligned word, that was a little finicky, but I love the payoff for all these little details got followed up in all these questions. It did take us to the very end to really figure out all the angles of the stuff. I love these kinds of details where we got to the end, basically, and we had figured out that the adults had left these kids. It was this real, it was a very nicely done arc at that third act where we got down to the basement at the end. We were very tempted to do this ritual in the basement, but we were smart. Instead, we followed it out to the graveyard. We had this seance with the dead bodies. Like, it all tied together at the end. It had a perfect arc, at least for us. And then there was a little bonus where we kind of figured everything out, and we thought, this woman has come and got revenge. And then we found, we decided, let's go look at the old records because it's probably going to tell us about the kids. And we were right. But was, what was really nice is it gave us sort of their, the adult's perspective who left them there. It made this much more of a human, uh, sympathetic case for everyone. 
And in fact, that was kind of the ending. The ending suggested that, you know, maybe everyone reconciled. Very cool. I mean, really, really loved it. I loved this case. I loved the mix of everything. The adult stuff of the death. The creepiness. The decisions. Really... I really loved it. And it was great playing this with this group who took it so seriously. Then there was the side stories of the treasure. I think it also... Uh, this this dynamic where you suspect everyone, mm, that's a winning dynamic. <laughs> like, it is fun to be in a... This is sort of the Agatha Christie style thing where everyone feels suspicious. But you know what? It's useful to compare this to suspects. There are a lot more cards in this game to suspects um, than suspects, but we've just played a box of suspects and liked it quite a bit. This feels like a much richer, in-depth, game than suspects. Suspects, you really don't get to know the people. And they give you like one line words about how they feel about each other. There is a lot more text in this game and it's a lot more involved and a full world of war. I mean, for me, suspects was fun, but this is a whole different level of game. And all of the stuff just worked in this case. Now, jo as Jonathan points out, it's a little hard to know um, how, if you could make bad decisions here and get stuck. But I think uh, one way this expansion is different from the base games, it feels like this one was a little uh, more... You couldn't really waste too many tokens on this one. It would be very hard to not have enough tokens to have gone into the graveyard. And these you're doing once per day, and the combat tokens you only use at the end. So I do feel like you couldn't go too far wrong in this case. And I'm not sure that was true in the base game. I think in the base game it might have been a little too easy to spend your tokens unwisely. And here, there weren't that much, there was very little spending of tokens, I think. Okay, so before we wrap up, we're gonna look through here and look for more stuff. Sergey says there's another bestiary entry, I'm curious. Um, there was this other clever new mechanic about these cards that disappeared that made us think hard about it. It was fun that the campaign continued on. This feels like a huge amount of work to make this case. This just feels giant. And it took us 10 hours to play and we still have got, there's still a third of the deck we haven't seen. And all the art, this just feels like a huge accomplishment. Sergei should be really justifiably proud of this. And it's sort of a shame that this is almost like an expansion. People won't realize this is a standalone game. People need to know about this game. So we'll make a video about it. But really, really... Uh, Fantastic, spectacular game. <laughs> really, really enjoyable. Okay, any final comments before we look through some of these things? Um, strong recommendation, looking for a creepy mystery. DJ Moneycat says, I'm not sure the tokens added much. Maybe could have been handled differently. Great atmosphere. Nothing made Jesse go into a rage. Isara says it was really fun. Enjoyed the artwork. Story was a bit scary at times. Sergey says wife did most of the illustrations. She will be pleased to hear words of praise. I thought the illustrations were great. Uh, okay, let's take a look at what we might have missed, just briefly. So we could have surveilled all these people. 
Let's just look at them quickly. We're just going to quickly. This is where he got caught. We could have surveilled the mirror. Oh, these are when they died, when we could have surveilled them. Okay, we could summon her spirit. I wonder what her spirit would talk about. Oh, this is where he could have died. It's so interesting that they could have died. I don't know what... I don't remember a question about that let us stop them from dying. I wonder if it's because we chose to sleep all together that they didn't die. I wonder what caused them to die. If we surveilled him, we see him looking around, checking for treasure. I'll find it. I'll definitely find it. It was worth taking that guy's life for it because it's going to make me rich. Whoa, he killed someone. Okay. The little girl, if we follow her, she just seems nice. She has a doll. You lie down and go to sleep now. Be a good girl or a ghost will come and take you away. Grandpa says ghosts steal away naughty girls. Cute. Tomorrow we're going to play with Yuka. He's good. He told me he'd protect us. I bet he did. He stoops around. But not Mirad. We're not going to play with him. I don't like him. <laughs> she knew the boy was bad. We, were, we, we picked up on that early, too. Okay. If we followed Garana, this is who we should have followed. Let's see. We just hear how strong she is. Okay. That's reasonable. Vaklov says maybe we deserve it. Okay. And Namira before she dies. He comes and they hook up. Okay. And he's going into her room. All right, let's see. There's a lot more cards. Let's just see if we can find some interesting ones. First of all, let's see if we can find the bestiary. Oh, there's a whole other place with scary stuff. Let's find the... I wonder why we didn't find that. Okay, so more answer cards. I get... I'm not sure what those are about. Different answers for... Different answers. I don't really understand that. Uh, let's do the ritual. So what was your guess about what's going to happen if we do the ritual in the basement? We were thinking that it might end the game with a fight or summon some other spirit, I wonder. Attic basement, okay. So, we did have a spare thing. Let's go back. A couple years later, we're going to come back and see what happens. Ritual is 49. Okay, let's see. All right. So, if you do the ritual, you have to have a fight right away. We cleared a small area on the ground. The magician sat down on the rocks and closed his eyes. We were used to waiting a few minutes for him to establish contact. But within seconds, his eyes shot open. His pupils glittered menacingly in the light of the oil lamp staring straight ahead. He slowly turned and tilted his head, examining us. We do happen to have two spare combat. Name yourself, spirit, Crest demanded, but the magician's lips curled into a twisted smile, which grew wider into a madman's scowl. Food, was all he said. Then he was on his feet and rushing at us, teeth snapping ravenously. Then to combat. It took all our strength to subdue him. For a full 15 minutes, he howled like a beast and twisted on the ground, chafing at the ropes we'd used to bind him. Then his body went limp. 
Me, it's me, the magician said in a quiet voice. He didn't remember much of what happened. The spirit was so aggressive. Sometimes after a summoning, they returned to the world of the living in the form of wraiths. Very dangerous. Is that spirit here still? Crest put a hand on his throwing knife. No, the spirit's very restless, but he hasn't become a wraith yet, the magician concluded. So we could find information about rave. Seventh number in row four. Let's just find it here. So we wondered if there wasn't another creature in there. Let's see what a wraith is. Let's see if this would have distracted us to think we were dealing with a wraith. Wraiths are restless spirits of the dead that are transformed through years of constant torment as though they are stuck inside a nightmare and can't get out. Eventually, the memories of their former life fade. Nothing remains of what they once were. They can become restless for a number of reasons, like thirst for revenge or the burden of bad deeds they committed during their lifetime. Wraiths are always hostile towards anyone in their vicinity of their burial grounds or whatever place their spirit is bound to. They're able to assume material form, taking on a terribly deformed human shape. Okay, so we would know they weren't imitating someone real. Some powerful wraiths can even possess the bodies of the living, gaining control over them. Okay, so we could have had to consider that. Whenever wraiths kill, it's always a ghastly picture. The fury burning inside these spirits forces them to crush and beat the resisting victim to a bloody pulp, tearing them to pieces. Okay, so we didn't see any signs of that. To get rid of a wraith, one must find the reason they're restless. However, a special protective symbol infused with magic is an effective means of protecting against wraiths. It also works well against a host, most other malicious entities. Okay, so we could conduct a ritual. Let's look at it. Whoa, look at that. Look at it tearing apart someone. That's terrifying. That's terrifying. All right, so if we were to do that ritual, we would have spent all our stuff. We would have put this on the wall to protect us. We decide the murders could be the work of the supernatural forces. In order to drive them away from the shelter, we conducted a ritual, painted protective signs on the walls of the rooms that were used most often. It took us a long time. Hopefully the results would be worth it. Keep this keyword with your characters. It may affect events that follow. What keyword card? Okay. Oh, that was the sign. So one of our end endings told us to check the sign, right? What ending was that? If you have the keyword sign plus two points for protecting. Okay, so if we had done that, we would have gotten protection, but I don't know if we would have heard from the dead people. Okay, let's just look at some other cards we've got. This is if we talked a lot of spirit. Who killed you? Did you hear anything? Not really. Why did Vaclav live in the hut? Mm, okay. It's actually easier if I do it this way. Okay, so we'd ask about why he's in the hut. Uh, the yard, we could have ended our day. This is if we lit her on fire. Doesn't seem like anything bad would have happened. Even, and that's what you guys wanted to do. You wanted to light her on fire. Vaclav was dead. Stable. Animal slaughter. What was this? All the animals had been killed in the same manner. What did this? What could enrage the killers so much they decided to kill all the livestock? I think... 
Oh, uh, yeah. You guys wanted to light her on fire. I think this is when we lit her on fire. We built a funeral pyre. We laid Lada's body on top, covered it with a white canvas. Okay, so you put her on fire. You guys wanted to burn her. I buried her. Okay, if you had burned her, this would have made, because we were dealing with the soul shadow, don't burn the bodies. It makes it angry. So if we had burned the bodies, this thing would have gotten so mad that it just, it tore apart every animal in the stable covered with blood. Wow. And Vaklov is also dead. All the animals were killed. Slit, deep cuts on their neck, arteries. What could enrage the killer so much? I guess this would have told us at least that for sure it was a soul shadow because we would have known that we angered the soul shadow. So the trade-off for this violence is that we would have known for sure we were dealing with the soul shadow, which would have been kind of cool. Wow, they're all upset. They're all scared. They dragged the animals, salted them in the hope they might last, and then it's the massacre, which was checked in one of the endings. Okay, pretty amazing. If we had gone in the pantry, we would have seen some poison energy. Don't know what this is about. We could do a ritual in the pantry. Let's see. He goes into a ritual. He takes picking up things. Returns shelf, picked up something else we couldn't see. What the... Is that suddenly he shook his hands and jumped away? Holy shit, he glanced around desperately for a moment, then his eyes shut open, he rushed out of the pantry. What did you see? What did I see? I feel like I was dumped into a waste pit. That pantry was used to store human flesh. Back in the day, at least a dozen years ago, I saw a dense black phantom on the shelf. It was some kind of object. I picked it up, but it was turned into black worms. Weird. He, so he sees signs of cannibalism. That might have confused us. Recent records is about when she came back in, when they came back in. Oh, here is about them digging up the bodies. That would have been useful to know. I guess if instead of doing the ritual at the graveyard, we could have done this. Some of the remains were buried in the basement. They must have died first. Bones lying all over the place. The people they abandoned, the anguish that plagued them all. Her notes mention a quarrel between Leda and Vaklov, who said she was wrong to have nursed him back to health. She should have left him in the shelter with the others. That was Jonathan getting right about her not saving the kids. And then I guess Vaklov causes them to get sick. Kitchen, he doesn't feel right about it. Knives of different sizes, white bone handles. Oh, this is the key that there was a kitchen knife that killed it that we guessed right. Everyone has access to the laundry room. They find a club. I guess maybe that was what they hit her on the back of the head with. Uh, well, if we chose to detain, if we chose to detain Yuika, and then asking people about things, a different place to end the day. Hmm. 
More alternate stories. We could ask him about Vakla. We chose not to do this. Who was it? It was Garana. What are you doing with that knife? Nothing. It's not mine. So he actually blames Garana, but he's got the knife. <laughs> Okay. Alternate ways. Oh, this is Namira could be killed. So let's see. So if we hadn't decided to all hunker down together, then Namira would have been killed. Not sure what this one is. We discussed whether to keep Eureka locked up. Oh, uh, we kept him locked up and then she died. Huh, different way to end the game. Lost the key. Eureka was dead, his eyes still open. What do you think brought out that card? So here's a way for him to have killed. Maybe if we lock him up in his room, shell shutter the windows or something. Put this card. He's talking to different people. We can talk to her spirit. How are you killed? I didn't see anyone, just a shadow. This is if we wanted to light fire to protect against the imp fiend, I think. I'm not sure. Uh, different way to end the game. Different way to end the game. I guess if people are dead, you get different questions. You don't blame them. Um, oh, look, if you blame the different people, <laughs> let's see, if we blame Tika and he says, are you out of your mind? And he rushes at us. He says the same thing as Garana says. She's are you crazy? Why would I do that? And they all say, you're crazy. Get out of here. We'll figure it out. Okay, here is if we blamed Rostik and Marishka, the little girl. We presented our reasons, focusing on the occult symbols Rostik had drawn on the walls and the child's footprints in the stable. They're in disbelief. They rush at us. It only takes us one combat to beat them. We might as well accuse Leda and Vaklov of killing themselves. They curse us out. Marishka, the little girl's sobbing. He, Tikkun tells us, you're crazy. That guy doesn't care about the occult. It's just a symbol in a book to protect them. Footprints are natural. Mirshka often plays there. I'm sure you're wrong, but if you're right, we'll need to deal with them ourselves. Then 92, which was one of our ending cards for questions. We tell them that it was Yuika. They say he would never hurt a fly. We say it's the mirror. Why would she do that? She lived there her whole life. And these are just multiple endings. Slightly. Seems like the same ending we got, but phrased a little differently. Okay, I'm not sure how many people stuck around for all that, but now we looked at all of it. Very cool, all these different endings, different things you could do to get different little pieces of this group. Uh, each of them had a backstory that was interesting. All right, final thoughts from the chat. Sergey says, in my personal opinion, the legacy of Eastbrook Hills turned out just great. I'm very pleased with the result. That's the game that Sergey has been working on. So for sure, we will be playing that.
Did I miss what happened with the massacre card? The massacre card was pulled out if you burn Leda, the creature gets angry and massacres the whole stable full of animals. And I believe the consequence is just a score difference, I think. But we can see if we can find the ending where it asks us about it. If we have the keyword sign, we do this. Where was the... I'm not sure we're going to be able to find it. But in one of the endings, it asked if we had it. Oh, here it is. Okay. If you have the keyword massacre 97, otherwise 98. Okay, so 97 was the card we I did draw. Let's see what the alternate of 98 is. Where's 97? Oh yeah, okay. So if you had Massacre, you'd read 97. Instead, we read 98, which I can try to find, but let's see. Okay, so 97 is a slightly different ending. Oh, it's just going to tell us why that creature destroyed the stable. So it's the same ending, but it probably... Oh, look what changes. The house is not happy and bad outcome. So the if we had angered that creature so much that it couldn't be controlled, then this place goes into disrepair. I'm less certain of what happened to Garana and Mirad after we left. Rumor has it that Garana was taken to town and hung from the gallows. A tragic finale to an equally tragic life. As for Mirad, he went missing the day we left and hasn't been heard from since. It would be naive to think the soul shadow is gone for good. We told the residents everything we knew about the creature. So, the ending... If we all for bear, all for lighting her on fire, so that's the little bit of risk that you didn't really have a great logic for not burning it. But but again, it's a horror game. So if you if you bury her like we did, because I insisted it, even though entire channel wanted to burn her, that's what got us this good ending here. If we had burned her and upset that soul shadow, then Garana would be hung. Instead, she got rehabilitated. Sergei says, for each ending, Massacre sends players to a worse option. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that feels good that we got that good ending. But if you didn't, It would just be a more horrific ending, but you also would have the benefit of confirming that you were dealing with the soul shadow, which could have been fun. Jesse gets MVP for overruling chat and burying the body. I I can't really get credit for that because my reasoning was not that it could be a soul shadow. If I had said we can't burn it because of the soul shadow, I, then I would get some credit. But really, I just thought, let's leave the body where the serial killer could go find it. And that didn't turn out to be true. Okay, any other final thoughts? Well, I'm looking forward to playing Sergey's next game. I know the rest of the chat is as well. Any other final thoughts from the chat? Sergey, do you know when... Um, Legacy of East Book Hills, East Brook Hills, will come out. Do you have any approximate publication date? Does it still have to be translated into English? It's probably a long way away. Will it come to retail? Will it go to Kickstarter? Anything more you can tell us about it?
Any other thoughts from the channel? DJ Moneycut says, good job, everyone, including the author. Sergey says, thanks for the game. It was nice to watch. Legacy of East Brook Hills will be released in Russia this year. I think in the USA, it can be expected in 25 or 26. So we may have to wait a year or more for it. John says, great to have such a positive experience. We've had a couple of games lately we were pretty hyped about that we wound up with more mixed feelings about. Well, it does help to have lowered expectations. Um, yeah, a real pleasure all around. A great group to play it with. Couldn't ask for more. I'm going to pat myself on the back a little bit. I think this green screen turned out to work very well for this case. So that was good. What more can you say? All right, let's take a break. Let's not, I mean, we're going to end it here. We've got a lot more games to play, but rather than schedule them now, let's take a couple days down to appreciate the fun we had. If you watch this after the fact, uh, not live, I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments. If you want to stop by the Board Game Geek Guild section for this channel, there's a link in the About page. You can help us decide what game to play next. Watch for my spoiler-free quick review of The Shelter, which I'll try to record in the next couple days. I'll see you next time.